Good morning, everyone. My name is Courtney Forehand. I am the CML Training and Marketing Specialist. I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar. For those of you who are elected officials and who have registered for this uh, webinar, you will receive university credits. Today's webinar is being recorded and the presentation materials along with the recording will be posted on our website at www.cml.org under training materials by the end of this week. For those of you who are not familiar, familiar with the webinar format, you'll see a control panel on the top right of your screen. There's an orange arrow on the left of the panel that will minimize the entire box. All participants will be muted for the webinar, but we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the question box on the control panel. We will hold a Q&A near the end of the webinar, but <clears throat> feel free to type the questions as you think of them throughout the presentation. At this time, I'd like to hand things over to Kevin Balmer. Hey, Courtney, thank you. And I want to thank everyone who's participating. It's my clock finishes going off in the background. Uh, for those of you who were, uh, and I think it's probably most of you that uh, were, uh, that participated in the effective governance part one uh, last week, um, uh, I intend to fully make it through my introduction before uh, losing a network connection. So sorry about that last week. And, uh, and I will probably repeat myself a little bit um, here at the beginning. Uh, my name is Kevin Bomber. I'm the CML uh, Executive Director. And uh, just a little overview about the Colorado Municipal League. For those of you that um, are newly elected and don't know as much about it, uh, your municipality, along with uh, every other municipality in the state, one or two small exceptions, are members of the Colorado Municipal League. And you pay uh, dues to be part of the league. Uh, our, key, um, uh, our key services are advocacy information and training. Uh, and this is uh, obviously part of the training part of it. Uh, the goal of this uh, whole series and all of our training exercises to help you uh, in your daily exercises as elected officials and uh, enable to uh, enable you to work more effectively with staff and with each other uh, and for the goal, as the title of the webinar suggests, effective governance. Uh, the league is um, uh, uniquely situated uh, both physically and, um, and, and otherwise to be able to provide training because we have certainly experts from within our membership, and uh, and when we get through this pandemic, a physical location by, for which to conduct our training and and get it out to you. Uh, in in a perfect world, at least one that um, existed before the middle of March, uh, you would have been at the league offices, which are uh, which is your building. Uh, it belongs to our members and and exists for our members. And uh, would have had this training there in person and would have seen um, Mayor Coleman and Heather Brooks and Chris Lindsay and uh, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Seitz and myself there in person to, to uh, and be able to engage with each other uh, and, and network with each other. That's something that's also critically important. We hope to be able to get uh, back to uh, soon as well. Um, a few things about the league that you should know uh, just outside of what you're gonna be learning today and, and if you were again part of the part one meeting which you learned last week. Um, the, the critical um, uh, aspects of the league, uh, again, are advocacy information and training. And uh, so right now our legislature's back in session, our um, lobbyists while not at the Capitol are, are working to uh, deal with the uh, issues of municipal interest. And that is obviously one of our key delivery services. Uh, but but uh, alongside uh, uh, training and advocacy, the information we provide is something that is uh, available to you at any time uh, for you to be able to access uh, and talk more um, at any point in time about services that the league provides for you to be able to get information through publications, um, our periodicals, and uh, other training guides. Uh, but it's something that um, uh, is available to you uh, to, to be able to help you again, do what you um, have signed up to do uh, uh, even better. And, and so let me take a moment on that. Um, those of you who are newly elected officials, uh, welcome to uh, being now part of the solution. You now are seen as someone that uh, can help solve problems and, uh, and leaders in your community. Uh, you'll be hearing from a couple of uh, uh, leaders in, in their respective communities today and and uh, 
and I encourage you to ask questions when you get the chance uh, and use the opportunity to, um, uh, to, to find out uh, more about how to do your job better. Uh, one of my key uh, requests anytime I talk to elected officials is is to challenge you to um, figure out how to work uh, better together with each other. You um, are now part of, again, a group of folks, all of whom um, have been elected to uh, serve your community. People chose you to uh, be in that role, and you all have individual interests and things that you wanna get to see done. But as a unit, as a council or a board, um, you're most effective when you can speak with one voice. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to uh, sacrifice your individual principles or ideals, but it does mean that um, uh, you can be more effective and uh, be seen as more effective in the community if you're able to work collaboratively, collaboratively together to be able to work uh, through issues. Uh, and maybe just the last thing, and maybe this is a good segue then into, uh, into the first uh, panel, is uh, to understand and recognize your role as an elected official and how to best utilize the expertise and talent that you have on your staff. Uh, you are the policy makers. You as elected officials establish the policy and it's your staff that implements it. And there are some really easy things you can do to make that more difficult um, by confusing roles and responsibilities and, and uh, not using effective communication, uh, but there are uh, even more ways that you can uh, make it a positive experience and can utilize uh, both your collaboration with your colleagues to, to affect the best policy for your city or town uh, and, to, uh, uh, and for your staff to make you look like heroes uh, through their effective implementation of your policies. Um, you're gonna learn a lot today. Uh, again, Staff Council Relations, um, uh, and, and I don't want to forget about Kelly uh, Nardi, who's going to talk to you about using social media, um, uh, something that uh, uh, is also easy to mess up. Kelly's one of the best, and so I'm glad that she's going to participate. And then budgeting basics from uh, uh, Chris Lindsay uh, and uh, Westminster's policy and budget manager and Mayor Pro Tem Anita Seitz. Um, I'm a, uh, not only um, uh, a, a the league director, but I'm also a citizen of Westminster, so um, I know that uh, you've got two of the best there. And I again encourage you again to ask a lot of questions when you get the opportunity, um, and to give a lot of feedback afterwards. And no matter what, uh, you can always reach out to the league <coughs> me directly at uh, kbomber at cml.org or call the league office, and uh, we'll we'll get you any answers you need all the time. Uh, good luck. Enjoy the. Uh, uh, session today and uh, get a lot out of it. Courtney, back to you. Thank you, Kevin. At this time, we are going to hand things over to Mayor Coleman and Heather Brooks. Thank you, Courtney and Kevin, and thanks to all the participants. Um, we're so glad to be here today. So congratulations. You made it. Your hard work has paid off. Now you can relax, right? I don't think so. Your work as an elected this official has just begun. Now what? There's you. What do you want to accomplish in your term? What do you want to be known for? There's the council and the board. What have been the priorities? And what are the group dynamics? There's the staff. What are their expectations? Do they have the tools and the resources that they need to be successful in their jobs? There are a lot of moving parts when it comes to operating the system a city or a community or different organizations. And every piece of an organization is very important. Today, we're going to share with you some tools that we hope will help you when it comes to running your organization. Now, normally the tools that we share with you uh, are, are good during actual normal times, but with the COVID-19 uh, virus uh, pandemic that we're, we're experiencing, Things are far from normal at this time. 
So as you begin this journey, I think the best step you can take is one that you're taking part of today, and that is to gather information, take advantage of trainings that are available. CML is a great resource. Um, a lot of local communities also provide an orientation for their newly elected officials. Um, the next part as you gather information is understand what your form of government is. You have a strong mayor form of government, a council manager form of government. Is it a statutory community? And how does that form of government play out for your interactions with staff? Because there are some differences um, that occur between the different types of form of government. As you're also gathering information, make sure you look at the resources that your local government has. Does it have a comprehensive plan that gathers the information on what the current situation is in your community, especially from an infrastructure perspective and what the vision is on where your community wants to go. Look at your annual budget. Um, you'll be able to identify what the priorities are and, and maybe where you think some changes need to be. So it's really important during this beginning step is to just really look at what information is available and orientate yourself. As you move forward in your interaction with staff, it's important to have clarity on what the different roles are and to not only understand it, but respect it and value those differences in the roles. So for example, what you might ask your city manager is very different than what you might ask your city attorney or the municipal judge or your city clerk. And they all are there to fit into that puzzle that provides a strong foundation to you as an elected official. So make sure you understand what those different roles are so we can manage expectations and get the best answers to you. As an elected official, it's important for you to know your role. You're always representing the people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To your staff and the city employees, you are always an elected official. You're never just a regular uh, person once you become an elected official. So be careful of the conversations that you have with staff and also know and respect the boundaries when it comes to talking to the staff as well. It's also important that you be accountable and responsive. Uh, everything that you say and everything that you do in public gives people an idea of what type of person you are. So be approachable as well. I, for one, I like to always be approachable and accessible. So I have my personal cell phone posted on all of our outlets uh, on the website, my business cards, because I want the, com the community to be able to reach me at all times. And being transparent has really paid off for me in many ways because people know that they can actually reach and talk to their elected officials. Now, the funny thing is I have my cell phone uh, listed. So people will call me whenever we have any type of issues that have come up and I pick up the phone and they're always shocked that I picked up the phone and they say things like this. Well. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Ty, I, I wasn't expecting you to pick up the phone. I was just going to leave a message. Then I would I always say, well, I'm on the phone now. Do you like to talk to me now? We can talk. All right, if you like, I can hang up the phone and then you can just leave me a message. Whichever one you prefer, I'm willing to work with you on. And people are so happy to be able to just reach someone who's elected official to talk. Um, so that they can voice their concerns. So I think it's very important to make sure that you be accountable and responsive um, when you're dealing with the public. Now, some of you are probably saying, well, I'm not going to put my cell phone out there and, and let people call me any time of the day or the night. Well, I'm just going to be real honest with you. People are so mindful and considerate and respectful. I never get a two o'clock in the morning phone call. I don't get many phone calls at all over the weekend. And usually people don't call me after 7 p.m. They're mindful and respectful. And then the ones who do leave messages, I try to make it a point to make sure that I call them back. Because the worst thing is, is for them to leave a message in for you not to call them back. And then when you see them in public, they're going to say, well, I tried to reach you like a thousand times. They may only try it once, but I tried to reach you a thousand times, but you never return my phone call. The other thing is you want to make sure that you set the direction of your organization. Lead by example. People don't always listen to what you say, but they do 
listen, and they do watch what you do. Uh, you have a lot of responsibilities and things that you have to make sure that you're in, you're, you take care of, like the budget, CIP, uh, the mission of your city or your town and different ordinances. So it's important for you to set the positive direction of your um, organization and your council and your board. For me, when I first became the mayor, the one thing that I wanted to do was set the tone about the importance of being on time and starting our meetings on time. We have meeting on, meetings on the first and third uh, Wednesdays of every month, and it starts at 7 p.m. Since I've been mayor, I've done my best, best to make sure that we start promptly at 7 p.m. So everyone knows, number one, that I'm respecting staff time, I'm respecting council members' time, I'm respecting the public's time, and I expect them to respect my time as well. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. Sometimes council members, they'll give me a call and say, well, Mayor, I'm running one, one minute later, two minutes later, I'll be there in a few minutes. And I always tell them, well, thank you for the update, but we're starting on time at 7 p.m. We will see you when we see you. See you. This is why it's important. Uh, when it comes to setting the right direction for your organization, it's important that you focus on the little things because little things end up making a big, big difference. So as the elected board is, is setting that vision and that direction and, and doing it as the mayor indicated through the budget and the capital improvement program and the mission, Staff's role is to implement that. It's to it's to take that direction and make it happen. Um, staff's also responsible for getting you the technical expertise. You've got city planners, city engineers, wastewater um, directors, and finance directors. So make sure you put some value on that technical expertise. Staff's also there to help bring experience and the historical knowledge. Um, staff has a lot of connections with their peers to kind of know what best practices are and what's worked and what hasn't worked. And um, it doesn't mean that, that that needs to guide necessarily the direction, but it's valuable information as you try to make a decision as an elected official. And really most importantly is you should expect a non-political approach from your staff. You need to depend on your staff to give you the information, sometimes on both sides of what an issue might be. And that ensures that you can make the most informed decision and bring in what you feel represents the community. And so staff's role is to help get you the best information you can make decisions. And then once you've made those decisions, to implement them. Roles and clarity is so crucial to running an effective organization. So avoid micromanagement at all costs. It is not your role as a council member or an elected official to get into the weeds of things with staff. That is the city manager or town manager's role. Uh, trust in your staff. Give them the resources and the tools to be effective in, in, in doing their jobs. And, and don't cross over the boundaries. You're going to hear me say that a lot. Check with your city manager and your town manager and find out where those boundaries are. Don't cross those boundaries. Some of you may come into uh, being an elected official with uh, particular skill sets. You may be a banker, and that's fine and dandy, but that doesn't give you the authority to call the finance director and tell them how to do their job. Some of you may have experience in uh, being an engineer, uh, but that doesn't give you permission to call a public works director and tell them how to design and repair uh, their streets. So avoid trying to, to take control of staff and avoid trying to take control of, of the council member as a whole. Remember this, it's kind of like what Kevin said earlier before we started the presentation. Our goal is to work together as a team. And sometimes you're gonna realize that um, the things that you are most passionate about may not come up that often. So meanwhile, you have to work on other issues with other team members to make sure that those issues that are important to the overall city uh, gets taken care of. And always remember this, 
you are working together as a team with the staff as well as council members. And the acronym for team stands for T-E-A-M, Together Everyone Achieves More. So as the mayor has indicated, just keep in mind that you are one person and it's the entire elected board that provides the direction to staff and to the community. So as, as Kevin shared in his opening, be authentic to yourself and your opinions and, and your beliefs, but also respect that at the end of the day, once the vote is done, um, that is the direction for the organization. And then as you ease into this role, this second bullet is actually a big one that can present itself in two different ways. And it feels weird. Um, one day you're, you're Bob and you live on your street and you have your friends and then you go to work. And the next day you're an elected official and, and you're not, you're, you're Bob that's rep representing Ward 1. And so one way this can present itself and it's changed overnight is when you're out in the community and, and you're talking to individuals recognize that they might be seeing you as an, an official, an elected official, and you're more likely to get quoted and, and repeated in other conversations. So make sure what you say is something you're comfortable being repeated. And it's, it's a bit odd that people will be putting more weight on the words that you say. And, and so the, the quicker you can get used to that, um, the better you're going to the second way this can present itself is as you interact with staff. And so I know for us in Alamosa, we're a small community. So a lot of our elected officials obviously know our staff prior to them being elected. Some of them are friends. Some of them might even be family members sometime. Um, but just recognize from a staff perspective, the minute you were elected, you are now the person that is guiding their organization and you're at the top of the chain of command other than the citizens um, for that organization. So if you run into somebody, an employee in the grocery store, um, just remember that conversation may be seen differently. So talk about the soccer game, talk about the weather. If you start talking about how you feel the operations are going, there's a strong likelihood you will make that staff person a little bit uncomfortable um, because you're seen as an elected official. It just it doesn't go away, the hat that you wear now. This next slide is extremely important, especially for those um, governments that are the council manager form of government. This is something that really can, if it starts to break down, can begin to hurt the relationship between your city manager and the elected board. And the key here is from my personnel perspective, honor the chain of command. If, if you work through the city manager, the city manager reports to you and then is responsible for managing the personnel within the organization, make sure you're respecting that. If the employee does not report to you, then don't cross that line. This isn't something that is taught as a way because they want to limit the power of the elected official. And it's not that it's to prevent the effectiveness of you as an elected official. It's actually to try to help make sure that the organization is functioning the way it was intended to function. So for example, um, if you're hearing nuisance complaints, maybe people aren't happy about how quickly the weeds are getting taken care of, or there's a lot of signs that shouldn't exist. Don't go to the police chief if the police chief does not report to you. Don't go to the police officer or the nuisance officer if the nuisance officer does not report to you. If it's the city manager that reports to you, that's who you should take those concerns to. And the reasons why is it's because the city manager is responsible for making sure the organization is accountable to the direction that council has set. If the city manager is not aware of the complaints that you're getting, then the city manager can't ensure that there's changes or that staff is meeting those expectations. If the city manager is not aware of a conversation you have with the police chief where you gave direction, then the city manager can't ensure that your expectations again are being met with that. 
the city manager is the one that should ensure that that direction and that the performance of staff is meeting those expectations. So sit down with your city manager, talk about the complaints you're hearing from that nuisance weed situation. Talk about maybe how you're not satisfied with what's getting done and then allow the city manager to kind of look into that. Maybe it is a performance issue and it's the city manager's responsibility to fix that. Maybe it's a resource issue. Maybe the officers need tablets in the cars to more effectively issue those citations. Maybe it's a scheduling issue as far as when they're scheduled and there's too much overlap. So there could be some different factors. It could be that we don't have enough officers. But again, you want to hear that from your city manager after they've looked into it. And then hold your city manager accountable for making sure that we're meeting expectations. On the next bullet, it refers to for those employees you do report to or who report to you. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Um, so for example, when you meet with the city manager, and this happens a lot, council members come up with amazing ideas and a lot of excitement or a new policy or some way of getting at an issue in the community. That's amazing. And it's amazing to get those ideas. But don't be surprised if your city manager has this conversation with you. Is it in line with what the budget is? Does it require additional resources that we didn't anticipate? Is it in line with the vision that council has set? Now, if it's yes to all of that, then I'm sure the city manager is going to be excited to be able to roll something out and, and get some change in the community. But if there's a question about that, or if it's a big new program, what's the most appropriate for the city manager to tell you is, hey, why don't we bring that up at the next council meeting? Let's have the entire group talk about it. And then the group gives the direction to the city on what direction to head in. So it's not that the city manager wants to dampen your excitement or your dream, but it's making sure that these ideas are in line with what the full board has provided. Because otherwise, depending on how large your board is, five, seven, nine, you could be heading in that many different directions. And we don't have enough resources for that. The last bullet is actually a little different during this time. Um, Pre-COVID-19, um, this was a little easier to talk about. So this one is keep in mind that the staff is a public resource. It's paid through public taxes and it's to work on public issues. Where we can sometimes see this issue come up is as an elected official, your personal cell phone might not be working or the internet to your home might be slow. IT doesn't suddenly become your 1-800 IT. Now, if it's a city issued cell phone or if it's a city issued computer, then yes, IT provides support for that. Now, clearly during this time of COVID and the work at home and meetings through these different electronic communication means, that makes it a little bit different, but once we get past this, just keep that in mind as well. Expectations versus reality. The pace of business might take a little time. So if you're a new, newly elected official, just remember sometimes the processes take a little bit longer than what you may expect. I'm always surprised when we get new council members who come on board and they come in gung-ho and they're ready to change the entire system that council has been working on for many, many years. As a new council member, Take your time. Seek first to understand before you're understood. Find out what processes and procedures are already in place and see how it's working before you decide to go in there and try to change things around. There's a reason why your, your city and your town has operated the way it has for a while. And sometimes there are some needed changes, but also understand that those changes takes time. Another thing to remember is that you operate under a microscope. We are always under a microscope. Trust me, we are entrusted with public funds. Our meetings are public record. Uh, anything that you say or do wrong could end up on the front page of the newspaper. So always be uh, considerate, always be conscious of what you say, be conscious of what you do, 
and be conscious of the way that you act. I often jokingly tell people that when I became an elected official, I really think I lost my freedom of speech because I almost have to stop talk uh, and I, I have to talk and be conscious of what I say and I'm not able to freely say what I may want to say at that particular time. It's kind of like I'm on a tape delay system. You ask me a question, I have to run the answer through in my mind, then spit it out. So just be conscious of what you say because you never know who's recording you and you don't. All your conversations you have to have as if you believe that it's being recorded and you want the whole world to hear what you're saying. So that's why it's very important when you have executive sessions, keep those conversations in executive session. Do not have conversations about things that happen in executive session outside of executive session because then you could be in violation. So make sure that you remember that as you um, move forward. Always be conscious of what you say, what you do, and the way that you act in public. And we've touched on this next bullet a little bit, but just keep in mind that prior to you serving on this board, that there might have been a lot of discussions that happened on an issue. It's still okay not to agree with a decision. It's still okay to not agree with the direction that the, the city's headed in. Um, but just be respectful that there may have been a lot of debates prior to you serving on the board. There might have been a survey that collected public information and, and thought on that item. And so you can still be authentic to yourself, um, but just be respectful that there may have been some decisions or discussions that led up to where you see the city at that point in time. On this next bullet, to manage expectations, there's sometimes I might get an elected official who is out in the community, they're out at the grocery store and, and, and they get surprised by, hey, did you hear about that gas leak at, at Bob's house? And they weren't aware of it and they feel as if somehow they were supposed to be aware of that. I think it's important at the front end to make sure you understand what level of information you're going to get as an elected official. And then if your expectations aren't being met, talk to your city manager. So back to this example, um, the city functions touch so many parts of everyone's lives from water to wastewater to trash to parks and rec. Um, there's just so many different areas, streets. There's no way to get all of those daily operational things that happen up to your level without gridlocking the organization and being information overload. So in regards to the gas leak, as a council member, you probably will not know if there is just a simple gas leak because honestly, when there's construction going on and multiple construction projects, depending on the size of your um, community, that's not something that even rises to the level of a city manager. Now, if there's a gas leak that requires the evacuation of a city block and there's health and safety issues, then that rises to the level of needing to make sure that elected officials are aware. So there's differences in that, in those levels of, of significance for the community. So just make sure you understand, you might interact with some people that expect you to know something that is so minute that it's just not at your level and it's okay. And then if the city manager does maybe overlook something that rises to the level that it should have been, make sure you communicate that because we're not perfect. And also remember that your passionate items will only come up a few times. Uh, oftentimes people run on issues like um, trying to improve crime, um, but those issues may not come up regularly. So during that time, you have to just make sure that uh, you're, you're focusing on other things and try to help the city overall with the other issues that they are facing and, and paying attention to other council uh, members' items that they may be passionate about. And then your passionate item will eventually come around and you'll have an opportunity to voice more concerns on it, but continue to work together as a team. For example, I know myself, I, I, I'm passionate about items that has to do with early childhood learning outdoor recreational opportunities for kids, anything to help uh, promote uh, the better development of the young people in our community. 
So those issues don't come up that often, but that doesn't mean as mayor that I just have to wait and work on the issues that I'm concerned with only of what, what was of interest to me. I have to also focus on other interests that does that, that's overall beneficial to the entire city, uh, the staff, and the other council members as well. So now we wanna get into some strategies for success. Um, one of the areas that I rely heavily on for building a professional relationship with my elected officials is a one-on-one -on -one meeting. We try to schedule these at a minimum um, monthly for each council member, um, regardless if we have something specific we need to talk about or not. Now, granted, sometimes things come up and they need to be moved or canceled and, and those types of things. But what I found is these meetings are a really valuable tool to have a safe environment to just talk as people. So you don't have to worry about your question showing up on the front page or someone snickering if it's maybe a silly question. Um, you don't have to have your city manager trying to make sure they have all the answers. It's a safer environment for your manager to be able to say, I'm not sure, but it seems like a neat idea. Let me look into it. Um, it also allows you to build what's that next bullet, which is trust. And, and trust is so important. I can share with you with seven different council members, we're not always on the same page. We sometimes have different opinions, but if we have trust and we have respect, we have a strong foundation to be able to work together. And we create an environment through these one-on-one -on -one meetings where we can have these differences of opinions and speak honestly about it and professionally, um, but then we, we know that we just have a different opinion. I also wanna share with you as a city manager that the more trust there is, the more likely your manager or administrator is to share confidential information. So a lot of times as staff, we might learn of information out in the community that doesn't require council action, doesn't require an official city role per se, um, but it might be information that you would be interested in as an elected official. If you've if you've established yourself as someone who will leave a meeting and, and go talk to a lot of people versus someone who can, can get confidential information and, and keep it to themselves, that's going to dictate how much information your city manager is going to feel comfortable sharing. And so an example on this is if we have a small business that might be struggling, they're not asking for help. Um, they don't want the community clearly to know that they're struggling. That's proprietary information. Um, but I think as a council member, you might be interested in knowing that. And honestly, it's something the city manager would be interested in letting you know. Um, but if there's something that the manager is worried about gossiping or the people finding out, then that can dampen that enthusiasm to, to share that information. So. One-on-one -on -one meetings, I think, are an important tool if you have the time. Sometimes we do it at lunch, sometimes it's in the morning, and sometimes it's just in the middle of the day. Um, but that trust can be very important. The next bullet point, communicate, communicate, communicate. Effective communication is critical in your role as an elected official and staff members as well. Know uh, what works and how people communicate because people communicate differently. I remember reading a book about relationships one time and they were talking about if you're in a relationship and you're talking about love, if, you, if you're in a relationship with someone who you have to tell that them that you love them, but you never tell them, you just show them that you love them by buying them material things or taking them out on dates or taking them different places, that person's not gonna feel love because you never tell them, you just try to show them. And on the other hand, if you are in a relationship with someone and their communication style is that you have to show them that you love them, but you never take them anywhere. You just tell them, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. They're not gonna feel loved either because you're not communicating properly in the way that they communicate. So always ask people, how do you like to communicate? Uh, and that's what I do. Each one of our council members communicate differently. Some like email, some like text, some like phone calls, some want to sit down for a cup of coffee. Find out how 
each member communicate. And then that way you can have effective communications with one another. Heather and I have four different ways that we communicate with each other. And for this presentation, I can tell you, we went and used all four of the present uh, communication strategies that we have. We email, we text, call, and we meet, just like she mentioned uh, in her, uh, her uh, presentation a few minutes ago. So the emails work like this. She'll email me throughout the day and, and she'll probably fire off maybe 10 to 20 emails in any given day. And I know when I get an email and she knows that I'm not responding to emails, especially all of them except anything that's urgent. So, but I'll read them by the end of the day, I'll read them. And the next thing is um, if it's a little bit more urgent than an email, then I'll receive a text from Heather. And that text is, is a lot more urgent. So usually that may, Need, she may need me to uh, take action on something, uh, but it's not really that that serious. And then the other thing is when I get a phone call, then I know, okay, that's a whole nother level of communication. Now that you're elected, what to do, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, 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 okay. we take yep. that, um, and then that, you see that, the little... that phone call, and then we move on from there. And then after that, if she says, Ty, can we meet? I know that's another uh, level of urgency in which that's when I know it's important that I show up uh, to meet with her as early as possible so that we can move forward. So having effective communication is so important. The other thing, when you're dealing with counsel and you're dealing with staff, um, always be civil, be professional, be considerate, be mindful. There's never a time to, to be uh, disrespectful. Um, the other thing is be true to yourself and own your opinions when you have an opinion on counsel, what have you. Be true to yourself. Don't be that person who straddles the fence all the time. I don't like people who straddle the fence. It's like, why are you going to straddle the fence? You're going to get hurt if you straddle the fence. Get on one side of the fence or the other side. Be confident in the decisions and the opinions you, you have, but don't be that person that straddles the fence and try to send those mixed emotions uh, to counsel and staff. And the other thing is, I noticed uh, a while back when I was uh, looking at different um, city councils and the way they operate, and I was looking at some of the YouTube uh, council meetings from different councils across the, the United States, and I noticed a lot of times you have these heated conversations where people are being totally disrespectful and arguing in public and yelling, going back and forth. That is not effective communication at all. Don't argue in public. I remember once my dad told me, he said, son, don't argue in pub public with another person because to the average bystander, when they see two people arguing in public, it's hard for them to determine which person is the fool. So when you don't argue with a person in public, it's kind of obvious that you're at least wiser and smart. So I always encourage people to be mindful, respectful, and allow people to uh, have conversations and dialogue, even though they may be different from you. And the other thing with effective communication, as a, as a leader, as an elected official, you're going to have people in your community that are on the far left of things. You're going to have people in your community who are on the far right of things. Then you have people in your community who are in the center of things. Just remember, you represent all of them once you become an elected official. So keep an open mind and listen and continue to work on effective communication skills. And so Mayor, I'm gonna move us along more quickly too. We're running short on time. So I'm gonna, um, for those listening in too, I'm gonna speed up um, my presentation a little bit. Um, the last bullet I think we've all seen is don't assume. For me, the, what I want to share here is sometimes people may not word something the best way or they might make a mistake or they might just disagree, but don't assign an intent or motive to that um, because once we start doing that and assuming certain things, um, then it becomes Machiavellian and you think someone's trying to tank your, your issue or, or those types of things. So if you are going to assume, which I recommend you don't, then assume the best. Um, another strategy for success is have that hard conversation. Um, there's a lot of times, well, I don't want to say a lot, there's a handful of times that the mayors come to my office and, and shared 
something that he would have wanted me to handle something differently. I value those discussions. As a city manager, if I don't have, I'm not sure if everyone needs to push mute, or, or maybe. If I'm not a, if I don't have city council giving me feedback, it's hard for me to know how to meet their expectations. I want to know if I'm meeting city council's expectations and you're not going to hurt my feelings. There are really easy ways to have a conversation that are professional, they're civil, they can happen in those one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, and while for the person who's going to have to deliver that message, it may not be the most comfortable, it's usually very much wanted from your city manager. The next item is you don't have to like each other to work together professionally. If you respect each other's roles, if you communicate professionally and civilly and, and you give each other the um, recognition to have different opinions, you don't have to like each other and you can still be effective. So you can just let go of that notion that everyone has to get along. It's great and it's great when you like each other, but it's not a requirement in order to function effectively. And then from a success perspective, you do want to push the, the box or the, the line sometimes on being creative and have we looked at this or have we looked at that? but make sure you're not trying to out-engineer the engineer. So if you're looking at a street, talk about the schedule, talk about beautification, talk about if you want a roundabout or not, but don't get into what the subgrade needs to be or what the width of a turn lane needs to be. So just kind of be respectful of, of those items. We're gonna, and I'm gonna speed it up a little bit as well, Heather. Um, we're, we're talking about strategies for success. Communicate appreciation. Have that attitude of gratitude. The number one reason people leave their jobs um, it feel, is because maybe 65% of the people say they leave their jobs because they feel like they're underappreciated. In our city, what we try to do is we always sh share recognition. Uh, we also have a, a, a picnic once a year to show appreciation to the staff. And uh, we also have a, a banquet to recognize people who've been with us uh, for several years. So always have that attitude of gratitude and uh, share recognition and, and, and also uh, say nice things to some of your council members and staff. Even though sometimes you may have conflicts with one another, it's okay to compliment them. You may say things like this, I appreciate the comments you shared with us last night. That was very thoughtful. Uh, thank you for allowing council members so-and-so uh, to talk during the meeting without interrupting them. That was very respectful. Um, one thing is to make sure that one thing that we do to make sure that all council members are having an opportunity to participate as well is I share in allowing council members to read the different proclamations and the ones that are specifically tied to the issues that they're concerned with. By doing so, they feel more valued and they feel appreciated and they are able to share in uh, getting their picture in the paper and, and being able to talk to the members uh, of the uh, groups that are bringing in those proclamations as well. Group dynamics. Uh, accountability uh, is, is, is a group responsibility. Now this is, I have to spend a little time on, I'll make it quick though, but uh, as mayor, I try to do my best to lead by example. I don't ask anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. Everyone knows that I'll do what is right, just and fair for everyone. And I do my best to um, let everyone know that whatever I do, I do it with good intent intentions. So um, it, from time to time, and I know it's probably hard for you all to believe this, but I do make mistakes, believe it or not, I do, and everyone does. So this is what I believe, when you make that mistake, own up to it, take responsibility for it. Uh, whenever I make a mistake, I do say, please forgive me. Just keep it simple, those three words, please forgive me, and then try not to make the same mistake again. Always avoid dysfunction uh, at all costs because it, it makes your team unproductive and ineffective. And then this is something I don't want you to ever forget as an elected official. It is not staff's role to correct council's behavior. Let me just say that one more time. It is not staff's role to correct council's behavior. It is the council leadership's role and responsible 
responsibility uh, to correct any inappropriate, unprofessional behavior. Don't let unprofessional behavior uh, go unchecked because what happens is it damage the council dy dynamics and it makes it real uncomfortable for staff to have conversations. In the city of Alamosa, when we have a council member that has probably crossed over those boundaries or not been uh, attentive or trying to disrespect staff, I'm the one who have those conversations with them. And I don't have a problem with having those conversations. Sometimes Heather or say, Ty, I don't think we're ready for you yet to come in. And then sometimes you say, I think you need to talk to Sue and so to have that conversation. Here's why that's important. When you don't allow those um, things to go unchecked, council respects you more. And the people who are uh, violating or pushing the button or pushing the envelope, they'll respect you as well because they know that you're not gonna let them just be rogue and run, and, and run away with meetings or, or try to be disrespectful uh, to staff. So make sure you have those tough conversations. So on this next slide, you could attend um, a webinar entirely on evaluation. So I'm not going to speak too much, except make sure you're doing them. Try to do them well and make sure you remember you're a group. And so there's a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of different ways to do the evaluation. There's a lot of different forms you can use. Um, I know you get busy. I know they're not fun, but just make sure you're doing it. That annual conversation to talk about performance and expectation is really important to have. And then remember, there's going to be some that might love the staff member. There might be some who do not like the staff member, but that final evaluation needs to be reflective of the group as a majority. And then hopefully you don't have to have this discussion, but sometimes it happens. But if you've been having the hard conversations throughout the year, if you've been talking about expectations, if you've been doing evaluations, hopefully none of this is a surprise. But it is okay to part ways with your city manager or with other direct staff. There's times that the elected board might be moving in a different direction, that the community is moving in a different direction, not the best fit. It's okay to have those conversations about separating ways. There may be times your city manager is not meeting your expectation and, and you don't think it's going to change. It's okay to part ways. There's times your city manager might be moving on to the next phase in their professional career. So if you do get to this point, recognize it's okay and really pay attention to what you're saying and how you're handling it because of this last bullet. My recommendation is less is better in this situation. When you're parting ways, we don't need drama. We need it to stay professional. You want your, your executive who's leaving to be able to move on to something else and, and without a lot of drama. But more importantly, how it's handled will be in the media, which means every person who might think about applying for that vacancy is gonna research it. And if there was a lot of drama, if there's dysfunction, then you will not get applications from certain professionals who don't wanna get into that situation. So keep it clean, keep it professional, and, and just part ways. It's okay. Use your resources. They're very important. CML has a wealth of knowledge. Kevin and his team, uh, they're so very resourceful. We reach out to them uh, often, and they are always professional and responsive. Go to conferences. The reason I encourage you to go to conferences is because when you go to conferences, you see other people who are in similar situations like you're in, then you realize that you're not on an island by yourself. The other thing is make sure that you take these webinars and trainings that are hosted. Uh, that gives you an opportunity to, to gain more wisdom and knowledge and tools that you can implement in your community and make a, a, a positive difference. And then the publications, just like the CML publication we received the day before yesterday, read that because you're going to hear about other information and things that are going on in communities similar to yours and, and, and you get a lot of information about different uh, laws and things that are, are coming down the pike as well. And then I always recommend reach out, call someone, uh, a council member or a, a staff member of another city municipality. I get calls quite often from people from different municipalities and they'll just call and, and, and talk to me about things that are going on in their community and I share with them things that are going on in our community. And what that does is it builds these bonds and these 
positive, healthy relationships. So do those things and I believe it, it'll help you as well. And then um, just from a city manager perspective too, to, to clarify one of those comments, just know um, for those city managers that are um, accredited by ICMA and the, the Code of Ethics, if, if you are an elected official and you call a different city manager, they're ethically bound to make sure your city administrator and manager know about that conversation. And so um, it's, it's not that other managers don't want to be helpful if you call and they'll answer your questions, but we're also ethically bound to make sure that um, our peer in your community um, is aware of that conversation. Um, your employees are on listserv. There's a finance director listserv, a city manager, a city attorney, a municipal clerk. There's a lot of different listservs. So there's a lot of um, information out there that your employees have access to and can help bring to you. And then sometimes we pick a peer city. Um, so are there similarly sized communities and how are they tackling the issues? And with that, I think our presentation is done. Thank you so very much. Great, you guys, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about those things. We do have a couple of questions for you. Uh, our first one is, if, a if you have a mayor and council, who does the town clerk report to? So again, I, I think you need to ask that with your own staff because it can present itself differently, um, even under the same type of definition of form of government. And so, for example, we're a council manager form of government, and a lot of times the city clerk would be reporting to the city manager, but for us, that's actually not the case. So even though we're a council manager form of government, our city clerk reports to the city council. So it's it really can be different by communities. And city council is the one who, uh, we are the ones who do the evaluation for the uh, clerk as well. Great, thank you so much. Our next question is, can you provide examples of how a board member can bring topics to the board? And is there an intake process that could be modeled? So this is um, an area where for our community, we do have a council policy manual and there is significant um, issues that a council member would want to bring up, something that would require maybe research or um, significant discussion on the agenda. We do have a process where the um, council member would work with the city clerk and then that can get placed on the agenda for the city council to discuss. If it's something that's small and it's more of an FYI, on our agenda, we have a, an agenda item that is um, council updates. And so, for example, um, at our one of our council members is serves on the CML board, executive board. And so sometimes on the agenda, she might provide just a quick update on a meeting from CML. And it, it doesn't take more than probably two minutes. So there's there's different tools available depending on the type of information you want to share um, and how much time it will take for the board to discuss. We also have two council retreats a year in which sometimes we'll bring up some of those items to where we could just discuss them openly and see if there's something we want to pursue down the road. Great, thank you so much. We do have a shout out thanking you guys for all this uh, great information that you've provided. And we do have a question, uh, Mayor Coleman, I believe it's specifically towards you, but it says, as mayor, do you try to meet with council members one-on-one? -on -one? You know, being, being mayor and communicating with council, what I try to do is um, I try to be fair. Um, I don't do the phone calling um, and trying to get people to vote for one side or the other of an issue because I feel if I call one council member, I have to call all six of them. Um, I don't do a lot of individual meetings with council members as well because not all council members are free to meet with me. So it makes it feel like um, I'm leaning towards uh, showing favoritism to certain groups of council members if I, if I meet with them but I am accessible to where any of them can meet with me or talk with me, but I don't initiate uh, those meetings because I don't want it to be perceived as if 
I'm showing favoritism towards one council member or another. We also provide um, some training from our city attorney for our council members. So there's some conversations that, that are good that can be had outside of a meeting. Um, and you guys are there to support each other. And, and so sometimes it's, it's good to remember that. But there are some legal consequences um, for a spoken will type of meeting where if you have a council member who's calling one to find out how they're going to vote and then calls another and says, so-and-so is voting this way, how are you voting? And then all of a sudden we're, we're violating um, certain laws. So it is important to be careful with that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Uh, our next question is more of a comment. Um, I think they're looking on a little bit of feedback on, on what they're saying here. Uh, it says, if you do not correct apparent behavior, excuse me, by a council member in a public meeting publicly, citizens assume that you are okay with that behavior. So the, I'm just, we're not going to put a lot of dirty laundry out there, but um, I feel like through the history of our different councils, we've had um, some unique circumstances with behavior that council maybe wasn't supportive of. And so from a personal perspective, those conversations usually do start behind the scenes. We don't want to embarrass anyone. And honestly, the goal is try to get the behavior to stop and, and to get back to a healthier relationship. If that behavior doesn't change, then council has elevated into a public discussion. And, and part of that is because there is a responsibility for the public to be able to know how is the council functioning and um, and if there are differences of opinions and, and those types of things. But it's important for us that we started at that lowest level um, because it gives that person an opportunity to change um, and, and to keep things strong from a group dynamic perspective. But if they continue to that behavior and don't change, then we have had to elevate it um, to a more public discussion. Yeah, and, and, and all council members know, um, I try to be just fair and do what's right. I'm not going to let you run the meeting. That's not going to happen on, on, on my watch. It doesn't happen. They're not going to run away with it or be totally disrespectful in any meeting. And the other thing is they know that if we are having a conversation uh, out of the public, I'll respect you just like I'm going to respect you in public. But if you do something uh, in public, I am going to have to correct you in public so they understand and they know the boundaries and if they're disrespectful in public and and i have to um address those issues i don't have a problem with addressing addressing those issues in public as well great thank you guys so much that was the last question that we had for you uh, so again, thank you, Mayor Coleman, and thank you, Heather, the city manager for Alamosa. We appreciate you guys so much for being here and joining us today to share this information. Our thank next you. presenters are going to thank be you. from uh, Littleton. It's Kelly Nardi, the Director of Communications and Marketing, and Shira Pullman, who is the Digital Media Specialist. At this time, I'm going to make Shira the presenter. Shira and Kelly, are you guys there? Can you hear me? Oh, there's Kelly. I hear you. Is Shira with us? I don't know. I don't either. So, uh, Kelly, do you, would you like me to make you the presenter? Uh, sure. I okay. think Shira just texted me. She should be available. But she's muted currently. And I'm not seeing her screen. Let me text her.
Oh, the joys of virtual meetings. I agree. I don't know what happened to her. Uh, is there anything that you'd possibly like to say while we wait for her? Good afternoon, everybody. Shira, are you there? Uh, let me try to call her. Hmm. Um, sure says she can see and hear everything, but it won't allow her access. Access to what exactly? Sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. Okay. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sarah Warner. I'm the Engagement and Communications Manager for the Colorado Municipal League. And just while we're, we're working on getting our uh, next presenter all set up, the joys of virtual meetings, as I'm sure many of you have probably experienced in some of your own cities and towns, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that Kevin briefly mentioned and, and also that Courtney mentioned, and that's the university credits. For this workshop, you will receive, I believe, three university credits. Mm -hmm. And what those are is they allow you to work towards different uh, levels of achievement within the Colorado Municipal League. Any elected officials automatically signed up for the university program, so that's not something that you have to sign up for separately. Um, but reaching different achievement levels allows you to um, kind of show your commitment to effective municipal government governance. And this webinar series is a really good first step for that. Um, so I just wanted to mention a little bit about what that is, and it looks like um, we may have Shira now. Is that the case? Uh, this is Courtney speaking. I have actually pulled it up myself, so I'm going to control it for uh, Shira and Kelly, if that's quite all right. All right, sounds good. I will let you guys get back to it. Gosh, sorry about that. Hey, no worries. If you'd like to uh, go ahead and start your presentation, that'd be great. And just let me know when you'd like me to go to the next slide. Okay. Um, sorry about that, everybody. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kelly Nardi. I'm the Director of Communications for the City of Littleton. I am also the Chair of the CML Public Information Officers Section which is a mouthful. Um, Shira is our digital media strategist, and if she can't get on this uh, webinar, we're in deep trouble because she is 10 times smarter than me. So hopefully she'll keep trying and she'll be able to join us in a, in a few minutes. Uh, so go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, just a little social media 101. Um, here are some of the basic platforms. Um, I think you all probably know about a lot of this. Um, some people think Facebook is for a younger generation. In fact, it's not. It's more for uh, people my age. Um, we like to share pictures of our vacations, our gardens, uh, grandkids, and such. Uh, Twitter. Um, Twitter is a whole different animal from Facebook. Um, most of the users are men. Um, the average age of a user is just about the same as Facebook. 
Um, Nextdoor is a really interesting phenomena. We were one of the early adopters of Nextdoor. Um, we have about 21,000 um, residential units in the city, about 47,000 population, and we have 16,000 plus residents of Littleton, verified residents in the city limits that are on next door. So it has become the uh, largest number of people engaged with the city of Littleton on next door than any of the other platforms. And then Instagram is a little bit newer. It's for um, a much younger generation uh, like my daughter. It's fast and it's visual. Um, All together for the city of Littleton, we have about 38,000 people who follow us on one or more of these platforms. And of course, some of those are duplicates. Um, one thing I will say about Twitter is it's become kind of a news feed. So uh, that's how the media follows the city of Littleton on Twitter. I used to send out press releases to individual media organizations and we don't have to do that anymore. We post it on Twitter if we want the media to know about it. And the next thing you know, they're giving us a call. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these slides word for word. Um, the I think the biggest takeaway I could give you about social media today is that if you don't post a photo or a video to go with it, you probably shouldn't bother it doesn't get a lot of attention without some sort of a visual to go with it. Think about yourself if you're on Facebook or Twitter as you're scrolling through everything that comes into your account on a daily basis. Um, the things that grab your attention are um, always something that has a visual with it, but a little visual can go a really long way. Uh, posting a six minute video also isn't worth your time. Um, anything longer than two minutes uh, is too long, and preferably your video should be around 30 seconds uh, in length. Um, at the city of Littleton, um, we post on a daily basis, and we initially started out with sort of a, a, a guideline that we would post uh, one posting a day. Um, now, we get so many things that we need to post that we have to be careful because there's a burnout factor there. If you're posting too often, um, <laughs> there was one fire agency that I heard someone say, they they post to uh, social media every time the firehouse door opens. Um, that's probably too much uh, because there's, you know, there's such a thing as fatigue. Uh, so keep your me messaging simple and concise. Um, Multiple accounts on the same platform for an agency is, I think, you know, needs to be decided on a case by case basis. Um, for us, we keep our social media pretty centralized. I know there are some organizations that are large enough where it makes sense that the human service agency has a Facebook page and the police department has a Facebook page and the library has a Facebook page. Um, but that can get kind of hard to um, wrap your arms around when you have so many different accounts. So for us, you know, all uh, approval of any additional social media accounts has to come through our department because, um, as we'll talk about in a little while, um, it takes a lot of love and care to, um, to have a social media account and to take care of it the way it needs to be taken care of. Next slide, please. Um, these are just some basics. Uh, timing is important. You want to be very sensitive to things going on in the world around you. Um, be careful not to post something um, maybe frivolous or entertaining at the time that there's some sort of a tragedy taking place nearby. So, um, we use a, and we'll get to that in a minute, we use a social media software um, to allow us to um, schedule our posts so that we can schedule posts over the weekend, for example. But you have to be careful, you have to pay attention because if something happens over the weekend and it makes your post 
uh, probably not appropriate at that point in time, you need to uh, be careful that you don't post. Next slide, please. Um, we use Google Analytics, we use Sprout Social, um, we have other ways to monitor our social media. Um, think about yourself. Uh, when do you look at social media? Probably not during the day while you're at work. It's probably um, later in the evening when you're sitting down to relax or maybe first thing in the morning as you're getting up and getting going. And again, don't over or underdo it. Um, silence is, is deadly. If somebody posts something to social media, they expect you to respond pretty rapidly. Can and I interrupt? If you're not able to... Oh, I figured it out. So I'm oh, here. Oh, Shira's that. here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, glad to have you, Shira. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Shira, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, absolutely. So um, somebody said to me one time at a conference that social media is like a puppy. You have to constantly take care of it. And I monitor all of the social media sites for the city of Littleton, and I cannot tell you how true that is. Um, even if it's Memorial Day, even if it's a Sunday with your family, that is something that's always kind of going on in the back of my mind where I am trying to constantly see how many comments we're getting, see if something's going viral, see if something is getting negative comments, positive comments. So it's something that you really do need to be committed to before you kind of dive in and start. Um, so I would just say we live in a world of instant gratification and think about if you send somebody a message, you expect a response. I try to respond to messages that are direct questions within 24 hours. And again, that's across all platforms. And you just try to, um, keep in mind that engagement, you want them to engage with you. So that's what they're doing. They're engaging with you and you really wanna encourage that behavior. Next slide. Now, um, this one is something that kind of made me laugh, this little post right here. Again, back to our goal, which is engagement. We want people to click, we want people to like, we want them to share those photos images videos those are very important if you think about your own personal behaviors you scroll right that's what we do when we're using social media so images and videos are what catches our eye it makes us stop makes us pay attention to what we're actually looking at that content needs to be accurate and concise but you can always get creative and make it interesting and this was one of my favorite ones um we were posting about what not to flush down the toilet very exciting content and so I was trying to get creative on how can we actually get people to stop and read this post. And it's pretty impressive if you look at the number there, we had 16,000 um, people that we've reached and it was just kind of a little silly joke. But if you are using humor, I think that you wanna keep in mind that if you can't say it in front of your five-year-old, you probably shouldn't post it, but um, it's just a way to get creative with that one there. Next slide. So dynamic posts, this is what I was um, kind of talking about here. I just wanna show you two examples. Those images, those videos, dynamic posts are what going to get you clicks. Um, this is an example from Twitter, and it's just as you're scrolling again, this post on the left here from Fox 31 was interesting to me and it caught my eye. You have an image right there. You have a link that you can click on to get more information, and it clearly states what that story is about and what they're trying to tell you. On the right-hand side, it's a little bit different. You'll notice that there's no image and it's just words. So you're not gonna get a lot of traction. And you can see basically on these numbers here, if you look below those little ticky tack numbers there, there's way more retweets for the Fox 31 than there is on the other side there. And there's a lot more likes as well. Next slide. And Kelly, I'm gonna let you take this one. Uh, well, I think this is just another example of what um, Shira was talking about um, with an image. I'll tell you, I've sort of put a ban on, everybody has seen that COVID image that shows what the virus looks like under a microscope. I've said, we are not posting another thing about COVID-19 with that image because I'm over it. Um, you know, this is this is tough information that CDPHE is putting out and, um, you know, 
talking about deaths, talking about people who are sick, talking about people who are hospitalized is pretty tough. So, I mean, this might be a situation where it's okay to go without an image because this is this is really tough information. Next slide, slide please. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Um, so it's kind of my motto with my staff that words matter because boy, do they ever. Um, Littleton police are not encouraging people to rat out their neighbors. Littleton police were getting a lot of phone calls to 911 from people who wanted to report their neighbors. So they asked us to post that if you're going to make a report of a violation, please make that to Tri-County Health Department, don't call 911. Well, the wording on this was such that some people interpreted it as Littleton Police encouraging people to report violations, and that was not what they were doing. And in, in the glorious world of social media, this thing went viral in a big way, and it went downhill quick, and we had people posting um, images of Hitler and calling the Littleton police Nazis. So um, <laughs> go on to the next slide, please. Uh, we had to do a clarification. Hey, everybody, we're not telling you to report your neighbors, but if you want to report somebody, call Tri County Health Department and don't call us. So um, we got it corrected, we got it figured out, but um, just choose your words carefully because things can go downhill in a hurry. Next slide, please. Uh, we wanted to show you this. We just did this a week and a half ago. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a videographer on staff and, and he does things like um, all the televised city council, planning commission, licensing authority. Um, the city of Littleton televises seven different bodies, city council, and then six appointed boards and commissions. But from time to time, he gets to do some fun stuff. So um, we just wanted to show you an example of a video that we shot about a week and a half ago. One guy with a camera, and this is what he put together, and we'll show you what kind of uh, social media reach it had. Oop, do we have we are having all sorts of technical. So if you click the um, sound down there at the bottom of the video. I'm, oh, goodness. I'm sorry. I think it's picking up. It was playing sound through my side. Let me try if I'm unmuted to see if everyone can hear it. Well, well, they mess with it and see if we can get any sound. Um, you know, I think these sort of graduation parades have gone on in a lot of cities across the country. Um, this was really organized by the school resource officer at Heritage High School, along with the parents and the faculty. Uh, they did it in a really safe way. They had, uh, parents had to be the drivers of the car, so it was done safely. Um, but it was really exciting to see how the, the kids, uh, the parents, and the entire community got involved with this because um, if you watch the whole thing, you'll see that people lined up on the streets all the way from the school down to Arapaho Community College, and they set up lawn chairs and they waved, and it was just um, it was just a, a terrific video. So I don't guess we're going to get to hear it. <laughs> have to go to our Facebook page. I cannot yeah, go watch it on our Facebook page. It's there or on our YouTube channel. Uh, Shira, how many views did that get on social media? That one had a pretty significant reach. Um, and I want to just point out oh, really had, quick. I, I, I've got it. It had more oh. than 8,000 views on Facebook. So, uh, that's a pretty good um, that's a pretty good connection. 
Okay, then, let's go to the next slide. And to piggyback on that just really quick, Kelly, as well, um, we did post this on Instagram. And so when you were talking about the numbers and sort of who uses what, this is a great example of choosing your audience and where you're going to post this because obviously, you know, this is a graduating class of 2020 and that generation tends toward Instagram over Facebook. So you can really increase your reach just based on what platform you choose to share. Alrighty. And sure, I'll take that? <laughs> dive into some nitty gritty tech here. Um, so videos and social media, traditionally video files are very large and they have to be hosted on a certain site, meaning that it lives physically on a certain site. So as we were talking about the different platforms, each platform offers sort of um, different advantages and different disadvantages. YouTube is the most common way to host a video meaning that it will live on that site. And what you just saw there, it transitioned over to YouTube and then it played that YouTube video, meaning YouTube was hosting it for this PowerPoint. Now, some platforms have the capability of hosting video. Uh, Facebook and Instagram are great options with that. We'll get to that in just a minute. But another note is keep those videos short. On average, people tend to stop watching things after about two minutes, unless they're really engaged and really wanting to watch it. Um, and that's another thing too that you can do is little previews, maybe just do a one minute little preview. As Kelly mentioned, we have an amazing videographer and he and I work pretty closely together. Well, he'll create a preview for me and then he'll create the full length video and we'll post those previews on Facebook or Instagram because it kind of gets people intrigued and then they can go watch the longer video if they'd like. Um, next slide, please. So tips and tricks for Instagram and Facebook. Um, fun fact, I don't know if you know, but Facebook owns Instagram, so they play nicely together. Um, Facebook and Instagram allow video hosting and a feature that's called automatic play. What that means is as you're scrolling through your Facebook account or you're scrolling through your Instagram, the video will automatically play. You don't need to click on it. This actually gets a lot more views and it, captures people so you can see in your analytics on the back end of social media just how long people watch that video and if it is automatically playing you get a lot more viewers for a lot longer period than if they have to click the video you kind of have to entice them as to why to click the video so these are great tools that you can use if you're using instagram or facebook um, instagram also has something kind of unique that they rolled out just a year ago which is called instagram tv the big difference there is if you're videoing something, you're going to hold your phone vertically versus horizontally, and it will show that video vertically, and then it'll play automatically in that Instagram feed, but only for a minute. And then it asks, do you want to keep watching this? And this also tracks analytics, and if that video is something that people are engaging with and want to watch for a longer period, they'll click yes, and then they're technically watching Instagram TV. So if you hear those terms, that's what people are talking about. If you'll click the next slide, please. All right, so tricks for video, Instagram and Facebook. I think some of these we did cover. Um, Facebook and Instagram also offer what is called a live feature. And we use this feature quite a lot. Um, the two best examples that I can think about are our city council meetings. We go live on Facebook, which is basically just as you would think a reporter going live. So it's actual live footage from your phone that is being put out onto Facebook or Instagram. Granted, there might be a touch of a delay, but we use that so people can um, watch city council meetings live. And then another great tool that we use it for is press conferences. So if we have an incident that happened and we have Commander Cooper who is addressing the press, I'm standing there, maybe I've got channel nine on my left, channel two on my right, and I'm in the middle going live as well to our Facebook and our Instagram. So it gets that footage out there immediately. And this is also something that's super helpful while dealing with the media. Um, I'm a former journalist. I worked for KOA Radio and as I was putting things together, I would actually go to, let's say Arapahoe County Sheriff's Facebook page and I would play that sound, record the sound of Commander Cooper speaking, and then I would use that in my broadcast. So it kind of cuts out that middleman and it really allows you, if you need to get information out immediately as a city, that's a great tool to use. Facebook also has a brand new feature that they rolled out 
I want to say maybe a month ago, and this is called video premieres. So what we do is we will create kind of a post that goes out and it says, hey, just so you know, tonight at five o'clock, we are going to be premiering a live video. When we tested this out, we did a garden contest and it was kind of wild to see the reach because it lets people know at nine o'clock in the morning, hey, I want to tune in to Littleton's Facebook page tonight at five o'clock because there's this video that I want to see and it's going to go live. So those are little tips and tricks and I can dive more into this. Um, happy to answer questions. I don't want to get too nitty gritty on the details of the tech side, but it's been really helpful during this COVID-19 time and getting out our information because we're seeing a lot more people who are actually on social media 24 seven. Next slide, please. So real quick, um, Twitter and Instagram, they're a little bit behind uh, as far as video when it comes to hosting it. Twitter will allow you to host a video, but it can only be 30 seconds. If, and that is with the automatic play feature that we talked about if you're scrolling where it will automatically play when you roll upon it. Now, Twitter will allow you to link to YouTube if you want to do a longer format video, but you will lose that automatic play feature and that will force people to actually click on it to see the video. Next door does not host video at all, but it does play nicely with YouTube and it will um, feature that video right in your post on Nextdoor, but you do have to upload it to YouTube first and then go ahead and post that link inside of your Nextdoor. Next slide. So I will let, well, Kelly take this one, I think here, I'll just touch a little bit and she can talk on the higher level of increasing reach just hashtags and what is an at, those kinds of things. Um, a hashtag is used to identify a word or a subject. So this is a great example here, this photo. We created a hashtag called Littleton Curbside. And the reason that we did that was during the very beginning when everything was shut down and restaurants were shut down, we wanted to say to folks, hey, please, please, please shop local. If you love this restaurant, we want them to be around at the end of this time as well. So we noticed that there was a hashtag that was trending, which was hashtag Colorado curbside. So in our posts, we not only shared that hashtag, but we created Littleton curbside and that created a life of its own. And so when you do those words together, it will show you everything that is trending in your Twitter feed or on your Facebook feed or in your Instagram feed. And it kind of collects all of those posts that are about the same thing. And then our branding for this, we created this image. We also, created a banner that went over Main Street, and we used a lot of this same branding imaging um, for our Facebook page, for our Instagram. These tools are very beneficial because they allow these posts to kind of be organized by the topic, and they are going to increase your reach because anybody who is seeing hashtag Colorado curbside is now seeing hashtag Littleton curbside, and then they're being encouraged to shop locally. Kelly, did you want to tag onto that at all? No, I think you covered it. Okay, next slide, please. So we've done uh, a few social media campaigns. Um, we're very fortunate that we have a historical museum called the Littleton Museum. And um, it is a great resource for the history of the city. Littleton is a hundred and over 125 years old. So we do have a lot of history. So uh, we created a Throwback Thursday campaign. We've probably been doing that for maybe a year and a half now. So every Thursday, um, our museum staff come up with a photo from the past and um, a nice little write up about it. And this campaign has been incredibly uh, successful. It's consistently one of our most popular posts. Um, Kyle Clark from Next uh, follows us and he has picked up on, I would say maybe a half dozen of our Throwback Thursdays and used them on his show with our permission. And um, so if you have access to, you know, any kind of historical information about your community, uh, people really love seeing these pictures of, you know, this is Main Street circa 1950. Next slide, please. So another campaign we did on social media, um, we started 
envisioned Littleton about 18 months ago. Uh, the city's comprehensive plan hadn't been updated since the 80s. Uh, it didn't even contemplate that we would have uh, light rail or um, a historic downtown. So it was in dire need of an update. And so Envision Littleton was the branding we created around the comp plan update. Um, we use social media uh, intensively throughout this 18 month process. Um, you can see some of the engagement that we did. Uh, you know, we didn't get rid of the traditional types of outreach. We still did lots of meetings in person. Remember back when we could do that? <laughs> um, but, but we also did a ton of digital engagement and had some really, really good results from that. Next slide, please. Uh, be a reliable source. Um, I had a mayor one time say something like he called it the reservoir of goodwill. You know, we put we put our chips into this bucket you know, every time we are building our reputation and building trust with our community, because you're going to need that because at some point in time, things are going to go south on you and you need to be able to tap into that reservoir of goodwill from time to time. So, um, you know, we really feel like social media is a great way for us to build trust. Um, however, you got to be careful with social media. You know, I, I've seen some places and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus but I've seen some places where social media was used in a way that had the opposite effect. I, I think um, using humor can be very tricky. Um, not everybody can pull off humor and everybody's sense of humor is a little bit different. So I think, you know, finding something like a, you know, a Winnie the Pooh that's cute that you can use um, to be funny is good, but just be very, very careful. And if you have any doubt at all in your mind, don't do it. Um, COPE is an acronym that I picked up at a conference a long time ago. For us, COPE means create once, publish everywhere. So whatever story that we want to communicate with our citizens, um, you know, we still have our digital Littleton Report newspaper that goes in the mail every other month. You know, we're not going to give up on, um, you know, the print uh, in your mailbox information about the city. Um, but whatever it is we do, we publish it across all of our channels, whether it's social media, on our cable television channel, in print. That way, everybody's operating with the same information. And, um, you know, there's no doubt about what message we want to convey because We've created that message and we're going to publish it everywhere we can. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to touch on, again, that all of these platforms, it's, it's interesting. You know, when you create a website, you can control that website and what's on that website and the capabilities of that website. But when you're using Facebook or you're using Twitter, um, they change all the time. They change their algorithms and you just have to go with the flow. So I've had a lot of folks who use this or work um, kind of my peers across Colorado that I've talked to have this constant feeling of, oh gosh, it's a new algorithm. Oh my gosh, I've mastered it. And now they changed it. So I think something to just keep in mind is that you're never going to be an expert but you're certainly going to be adaptable. So as you're using uh, social media for all of this stuff and they constantly change, don't get frustrated, you're not alone. <laughs> Next slide. And some tips and tricks and tools that help. There's a ton of tools out there that do work for social media. I do wanna say there's one caveat, Nextdoor does not allow them to link to them. So Nextdoor is kind of a special entity across the board, they've got some pretty significant um, privacy rules that they like to stick to. But you can use Hootsuite, there's another um, application, Sprout Social, there's Adobe Spark. And a lot of the times what I will do, um, I went on vacation for two weeks and so I went ahead and scheduled all of these posts in advance because I knew what was happening and I knew kind of what we wanted. As we talked about, you don't wanna go a couple of days without posting, you don't wanna lose that engagement with your audience. So these tools are great to have that, but something to keep in the back of your mind is that if something does happen, um, if there's, I don't know, 
knock on wood, but some catastrophic event, you want to unschedule those posts because in the middle of that, you don't want to be saying, oh, here's Winnie the Pooh. But um, that is great tools. You can also use um, alerts. A lot of different platforms, Facebook is really good with this. Nextdoor is really good with this. I will get emails. And so the example that Kelly had used earlier with the police ratting people out, it was a Friday night and it was eight o'clock at night and my phone was just pinging because I was getting those email alerts letting me know that this post is getting a lot of attention. And I was really grateful that I had set up those alerts because they had allowed me to then go ahead and create that clarification. We could nip it in the bud that way instead of going the entire evening and not even knowing that that was happening. Um, and then I think another thing that you can do is set up automatic responses. So as we talked about trying to get back to people within 24 hours, sometimes it's okay to just go ahead and say, hey, I see you, I hear you. I know you asked me a question, I'm working on getting that information. And you can set up those automatic alerts where when somebody messages to your account, it will reply automatically and say, the city of Littleton, you know, maybe our hours of operation or whatever it is. So that way you can still engage with those citizens and you're not actually having to hold your phone and type those words. Um, the last one I would say is use Google to your advantage. If you don't know the, the way something works or if you wanna dive in deeper on any of these platforms, you can just Google it. They are, as I said, constantly changing their algorithms. And again, the video premieres was a brand new thing. So. I Google things all the time to try and figure out better ways that I can use this platform to my advantage. Next slide, please. And that concludes our presentation, but we'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Great, so we do have a question and I'd like to say thank you. Thank you guys so much for that presentation. Um, our first question is, what is the process you use to avoid social media? Uh, I'm sorry, to approve social media content. Um, I have a really awesome boss who trusts me. <laughs> so I create all of our social media content and I um, am the one responsible. So, but I will also say the buck stops with me. And there are a lot of times that I'm constantly in Kelly's office getting clarification, asking questions making sure I understand things before we put it out there. But I personally, um, my workflow is I have a calendar that I keep. I use Trello, it's just a, another application that um, keeps me organized because I will have all different departments reaching out to me all the time, whether it's public works and then economic development needs this, but community engagement wants this. And so I can organize those so that way it's not seven posts about the census, one right after the other. and it sort of keeps me on track, but it also allows us to get that information out. Great, thank you. Also recommend Trello, it's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Wendy is saying, uh, thank you guys so much for all this useful information. Our next question uh, is, during COVID, has there been additional approval processes? Um, not with social media. Kelly, what would you say on that? Well, pretty much I create all of that content. Um, I guess I create all the content around the stuff that's um, tricky. Um, mm -hmm. Shira really manages sort of the routine stuff like, you know, a program at the library and, you know, the other things that she mentioned, but the things that have to do with city council uh, policy, uh, things with COVID-19, I'm pretty much creating all that content and then Shira is publishing it across our channels. Um, I feel really fortunate, um, you know, our city manager's been city manager for I think almost three years. And, you know, when you get a new city manager, you, um, you know, have to figure out their style. And some city managers, you know, like that control and want to review everything. And my city manager, I feel so lucky. I think he has a great deal of trust in me and my staff. And um, so I don't really run much through the city manager unless it's something that's really, really, really tricky. Uh, but most of it, you know, we just go with it. And with the COVID, um, I would like to highlight too, something that we were doing is we noticed 
Kelly was just writing press release after press release after press release, and we were putting out so much information all at once that um, she had the idea to create, well, well, we have a Littleton report, which is a physical newsletter that's mailed out to every postal patron. And she created this Littleton report online. So now we have a little newsletter that will email out, but at the same time, we'll use that link and then the content in that where I can share it out through our social media channels. So that's definitely been a shift that we've done during kind of this time of everybody's digital, everybody's on their computer, so we can really meet that need to still get the communication out, but not have kind of communication burnout. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how is internet security insured? <laughs> That's a good um, one. <laughs> we have an IT department. <laughs> that and um, um, HTTPS. You know, we have a we have a fairly um, new IT director, and cybersecurity is huge for us us right now. Um, so I don't have to worry too much about that because they take care of that. But I can tell you in my inbox, I have a um, a remedial training I have to take because they are sending out um, simulated fishes. And if you reply to it, you have to do remedial cybersecurity training. So I have one in my inbox I have to complete. Um, they've been doing some very clever things to um, teach us the importance of paying attention to any email or any link that you open. And as far as the city goes too, on our website, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed when you go on a URL, and you have that little HTTP colon backslash backslash. If you have an S after that, it's HTTPS colon backslash backslash. So everything that the city tries to use, um, we share that. That's, that means it's secure, sorry. The S stands for security. And so when I share things, um, I look for that and I try to share, you know, obviously we drive a lot of traffic back to our website or we drive it to other, you know entities but we definitely make sure that that is secure before we share it on our site because again we don't want to be sharing links that are corrupt or something that is going to be malware if if you click on it okay the next question comes from dave he is asking for a little bit of a, a clarification or a proper response to citizens that might put a little bit of drama on social media uh, for example, how do you keep from getting it snarky or how do you respond to someone when it does? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I can tell you there's times I put the phone down, walked away and then come back. Um, I think the biggest thing that I just try to keep in my mind is that there's always going to be trolls. There's always going to be people who, you know, we have one gentleman that's a good example we cannot plow the streets correctly to save our lives according to him. And every time it snows, we're guaranteed to get a message or a post. And so a lot of what I do is I will work really closely with Public Works in that case. And I've already drafted with the Public Works director a response on this is our snow plow route. These are our priorities. This is why. And so something that you can fall back on with that is giving them a link to that. You can always give them the link to information. So they can go to the website and see the snow power out and those are the rules. Um, I try not to respond unless it is a direct question or a direct message. I always try to say thank you for your comment because again, our goal is engagement and you want people to engage and then you kind of let them go. I think a lot of the time you'll see that folks correct each other and it might turn into a little bit of a fight on your feed or on your post, but I just let them have that conversation because both sides tend to come out. Um, the only time that we will take something down is if it's vulgar or uses offensive language. And we have drafted a social media policy where it clearly states that we are going to do that. So we've set up all these rules in advance. Um, but yeah, I would just say the biggest thing is that take a deep breath and remember that you're the professional. And so you're representing your agency and at this time, though, you might want to be a little snarky, probably not a good idea. And also just information. 
we were um, doing some communications about the election as well. And that was something that I just found it was a lot easier instead of me trying to say, no, that's not correct. That's not what that means. But then to just send them the link where they can clearly read exactly what that ballot says. And if they comment back, I don't like these links, just give me a straight answer. Just say, I'm trying to provide all the information. Here's the link. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, our next question is, what are the absolute social media essentials for small towns that cannot dedicate an employee or a team in managing social accounts? You know, I, uh, I would say, um, I did a presentation for CML a while ago um, and really, you know, respect the fact that we do have so many small towns with a limited staff. What I would say is start small, just take it one thing at a time. Um, I think Facebook is probably the most utilized of all the social media channels at this time. And I would go simple and uh, start a Facebook account for the town. And if you have technical problems, I would find the youngest person on your staff <laughs> and have that person help you get it set up and have that person help you work through, you know, any of the issues, that, you know, to get it going, to get it off the ground. But I think starting out with a simple Facebook page would go a long way. What do you think, Shira? I agree with Kelly on that comment. And um, again, right? social media is free like a puppy is free once you have it you have to take care of it so i would start small and just do a facebook and then i would also say you know the biggest thing that i think is get creative we are very blessed that we have a videographer but there are times where i don't have time to have tyler create a video or create something for me and so the little phone in your hand is so powerful nowadays it can do videos for you it can do photos and it doesn't have to always be i know i say dynamic posts are going to get you clicks and engagement but sometimes i'll just do a screenshot um and then post that photo so like applications for boards and commissions i can't think of an image that goes with that so i just took a screenshot of the application that's online and posted it so you can get very creative with just trying to think outside of the box. And I think the biggest thing too, citizens are not necessarily looking at you to be super funny or creative or any of that. They really are following you because they want that information. They want information and that's what you're providing. So as long as you are pushing out communication, I think that you're meeting those needs. And I, I think if you want to build engagement, you know, anytime you can post a photo of animals or kids, <laughs> you're probably going to get a lot of people react. Another thing that we do um, that just gets so many people engaged is when it snows, we'll go out in front of the building and take a, a yardstick and stick it in the snow and, you know, take a picture of it. And we'll say, you know, six inches of snow at the Littleton Center. And then the whole thing just explodes. Then everybody's got a picture of their back porch and their lawn furniture and their car and their driveway. And everybody's posting pictures of their snow. So stuff like that, you know, weather, people are really interested in stuff that happens with weather. Um, so anything like that that you can do, that will help you build engagement. And one more thing is, you know, use the team that you do have. So maybe you're a one man band communication person, but have that relationship with police. And um, we have, you know, a great police department and our PIO, he'll text me a photo sometimes of just, they stopped and played duck, duck, goose with some kids in the park. And so I've had that conversation with him in advance of, if you see anything, please just send it my way. I may post it, I may not post it, but please just flood my inbox with content that you see out in the world and send it to us because then those are more resources that you can kind of use. It's just a quick photo for them and it helps you a ton. I think a good example of that happened just this week. We had a, a bunch of goslings who yeah, went little... <laughs> into the storm sewer drain and there was a police officer and the humane officer and one of our public works guys and 
they had to go down into the drain to get one of them. But, you know, we took a picture of them out there saving these little baby geese. And, um, you know, that went crazy on social media. And that is a great point of that because neither nobody from the communication staff went out there. We didn't have time or capability, but we have that relationship with our team where I think it was actually our mayor who sent us the photo. So, you know, you can just use everybody who's at your disposal. So the final question sort of builds off of that. Oh, no, another one just came in. I'm sorry. Uh, so one final question uh, sort of builds off of that and is, how do you determine whether content is relevant to your community? And do you aim for a certain ratio of local to national interest posts? For example, the census. Yes, um, I think, gosh, we don't do a lot of national. I would say our biggest thing is the census right now because that affects our community, right? That affects uh, everybody and our funding and a whole bunch of things. So I try to do very local. And again, I, I think back to that slide with the smiley face and the grumpy face, you're not always going to get it right. You, I can't tell you how many times I've posted things, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be big, nothing. And then I post things like, I don't know if this matters, but I don't know, I'm gonna put it out there and then it goes viral. So there's different times, different things. I think that you just need to think about your community, know your community, get involved in your community. And just listen. A lot of the times I like to listen to what people are talking about and what they're saying and what they care about and piggyback on that. It's not, you're not reinventing the wheel so much as just looking on Twitter and seeing what's trending and then thinking, hmm, how would this affect residents in my community? What does this mean to them? So that's kind of my thought process there. We also have so much stuff going on that I feel like I would much rather be accused of over communicating than under communicating. Kelly, did you, what do you think on that? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the final question is, uh, do photos of kids or people uh, risk privacy concerns? That's a good so, question. Yep, that's a good question. Um, you know, our attorneys have always said if people are in a public place, they don't have a, um, they've sort of given up their right to privacy. So, um, you know, we'll have a concert or we'll have a program at the museum or the library or one of our special events. We shoot video, we take pictures. We've never had a problem with it. Yeah. The it's biggest different if you're shooting a picture of somebody in their front yard. Um, and of course, you know, when we do things with school district, you know, we work with the school district, but um, in a public place, you have no expectation of privacy. Just be mindful schools. Um, that's the biggest thing I can think of is if you are going into a school. Um, but again, that parade was on the street and it was public. So it's kind of, again, that reporter mentality is that I'm standing in a public place. So it's legal. All right. Well, thank you so much to Kelly Nardi and to Shira Coleman from uh, Littleton for sharing this information with us today. At this point, we are going to turn things over to Westminster. We have Chris Lindsay. He is the Policy and Budget Manager. And we have Anita uh, Seitz. She's the pro Mayor Pro Tem from Westminster. I'm going to make Chris our panelist. And are you guys with us? We are. How are you? No complaints. Thank you for asking. <laughs> are you there, Chris? Ah, uh, there we go. There we go. There we go. And here. Are you able to see my screen? We are. Excellent. We are. Uh, very excited to talk to everyone um, this afternoon about budgeting basics. Um, for those of you that uh, are new to the budget process, um, happy to uh, happy to run through this. My name is Chris Lindsay. I'm the assistant city manager um, for the city of Westminster. Uh, I lead the policy and budget department, uh, and we're charged with um, helping council and senior staff formulate that uh, budget every every year. 
um, and I'm joined by Anita, if you would like to introduce yourself. Hi, so I'm Anita Seitz. I'm um, currently the Westminster Mayor Pro Tem. I was I first got on Westminster City Council in December of 2013. Um, so I've been on for a little while and have had the pleasure um, of going through many budget cycles and learning kind of the, the pitfalls and the power of the budgeting process. Um, and I'm excited to kind of share what I've learned um, and my perspectives as an elected official and how we can be most effective. Thank you, um, Anita. So with that, we'll jump right in. Um, briefly, just our outline, uh, really, really basic and, and short and sweet, which is kind of the way I like it, but but what is what is a budget? Why do we budget and how do we budget? And then some tips and tricks and, and policy type items at, at the very end. Um, I did wanna highlight, I think um, I'm really happy that Mayor Pro Tem Sites was able to join me um, this afternoon because I think it presents a really um, good perspective to hear from uh, both of us and kind of what we see through our eyes as we go through uh, a budget process. So that of an elected official um, and then that of a staff perspective. So I, I hope we can both uh, both chime in and, and provide you some assistance as we move through this. Um, right off the bat, what is a budget and, and what does it mean for us? So budget is the financing plan um, on, on what we intend to get done within the next year or two, and I'll highlight that, and also how, um, how we intend to do that. Uh, I mentioned too at the bottom, the city of Westminster partakes in a two-year budget process, um, and uh, some of your cities may as well. Uh, it's a little less common than the one-year budget process. Um, Budgets are all of these, a policy guide, an operations guide, and a um, communications tool. And we're gonna talk a little bit about each of those. I realize many of you are, are likely familiar with a private sector budget um, and maybe not as much of a public sector budget. So uh, typically a planning tool, revenue forecast, and really with the private sector, a lot of times you're talking about a guide for investors with your budget. Uh, in the public sector, we'll get into a little bit more of this as a policy guide, uh, but a budget is a legally adopted tool and a set of guidelines for how the government will spend and manage its money. Um, and oftentimes it's the legal authority and the policy level for management to provide a given level of service. And sometimes it describes the manner in which that will happen. Um, so I think those are those are some key differences there. And I did just want to show you an example of a line item budget. Uh, this is directly from uh, the City of Westminster's budget system uh, and our financial financial management system. Uh, there's a lot of detail that we see at a council, at, we see at a staff level, excuse me, um, that often doesn't come through uh, to what's communicated to council and especially to the general public. Um, but just to give you uh, give you a little insight. We see we see things at a very granular level at a staff uh, staff level, and we seek to balance that budget um, across all these individual lines and business units, and divisions, and departments. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sites to talk about a policy guide. So I think it was really important to hear um, at, at the beginning when Kevin Bomber introduced this session and. Um, throughout Mayor Coleman um, and City Manager Heather, and I apologize, I've forgotten her last name, talk, they really talked about remembering your role. Um, and looking at the budget as a policy guide is a good way for an elected official to, to stay within their appropriate role. Um, so the budget is a large document and it can be really information. There's a, a overwhelming, there's a lot of information in it, especially a city the size of Westminster and we're a full service city. We're our own utility, our own fire department. So it's a, it's a pretty big document. Um, and I think it's really common, or at least it was my impulse to, to almost exercise that oversight portion of our role and, and almost look like at it as an auditor, making sure everything adds up. Um, but that is not the way um, to really involve yourself with the budget as an elected official. Um, sticking up and making sure that you understand that this budget is the first opportunity after the strategic planning process 
for staff to show that they've heard um, what your goals and visions are for the community um, and prioritized our scarce resources um, towards those priorities and those responsibilities. Um, and so it's it's really valuable to make sure that you um, are checking in, making sure this is um, implementing the priorities as you had intended them to do, um, or making sure that you uh, agree with kind of how staff has, has tried to implement the direction you've given them previously. Um, so I think with that, let's go to the next slide. So I think one of the really valuable things as an elected official is to get the budget and realize it can be a reality check. We all have a lot of great ideas when we're running for office, um, plans that we'd like to see implemented in our city and in our community, and that if we had no revenue constraints, we'd be able to, and no capacity constraints, we'd be able to um, do a lot, right? Pave, pave the streets with gold. Um, but we don't have unlimited revenues and in fact the only reason we're able to use these taxpayer dollars is really with that strong nexus of providing public value to our residents and so looking at this budget um, and making sure it's prioritizing the needs of the community um, and the policy directions is our role um, so examples of priorities that we've had and that our budget represents is improving our roads um, we wanna make sure that we have a, a really effective workforce here in Westminster so that we can um, you know, do a good job meeting the quality of life needs of our residents. Um, we need to make sure our public facing departments are open and operational for our residents to utilize them. Um, and every community wants to make sure um, we have public safety. Um, you may have different priorities, um, but those are just examples of some that can be articulated through the budget. Next slide, please, Chris. And uh, I'll jump right back in. So also mentioned the budget is an operations guide. And this is really where the budget provides the staff the direction they need um, to take that high level direction from the city council um, and then implement it into public facing or internal activities um, and programs. Um, you know, the budget is ultimately um, an allocation of scarce resources. And many times it's uh, what you can't do as much as you can. Um, so it really, the budget as an operations guide really forces your staff uh, and that professional management that you hire to be disciplined and constrained in their spending. A lot of times you see this as uh, financial policies uh, that might also be adopted with the budget um, or go hand in hand with the budget. Um, a, a budget can be a high level appropriation across a fund or department, um, but it also impacts uh, how budget and uh, funding can be transferred uh, between departments and funds and programs. So it provides structure in that form for your staff. Um, it also typically includes things like debt service, but also potentially direction um, on when to use debt uh, as a local government. So I think it's also important that we realize that the budget is a really powerful communication tool to our um, community. So there's a lot of different areas where the community has their fingerprints on our budget um, and, and on the priorities, um, what, what's in our capital plan and what's in our operating budget. Obviously the first time is at election when they decide who are going to be the elected leaders that go over it. Um, but we also include um, opportunities for um, the, the public to weigh in on the budget um, throughout our budgeting process and finalize, finally with a public hearing um, prior to adoption. Um, so right here, I think this it's hard to read, but it's an important line. Um, the budget is the fiscal expression of our vision for the future. This budget has been crafted by staff to align with the vision, mission, values, and strategic plan direction from you, mayor, um, and counselors. Um, and so it kind of goes, this is a, a public document, obviously, and connects um, what, what has been allocated with both um, these kind of large um, vision statements for our community. We also get feedback in the way of um, a citizen survey where we are constantly making sure we're hitting the mark, 
Um, you can see this was from one of our more recent citizen surveys, 68% of our residents felt they were getting a good value for city taxes paid. And while I think most of us on this are probably overachievers and 68% doesn't always sound good, it's actually higher than the national benchmark um, in Westminster. Um, and 88% of residents felt they were getting um, the financially sustainable at their image of the city. Um, so we wanna make sure that this, this represents both council's vision, but also has the fingerprint of the community on it. Um, can you go to the next slide, Chris? Um, again, this is our strategic plan, um, a little bit more in depth. Um, let's go to the next slide, Chris. This is another way we've um, included citizen feedback into our city um, budget. And so prior to the strategic planning, we do a lot of community su summits, understanding um, what people really value about the community, where they want us to go and what concerns they have. And that's folded in at the very visioning state, uh, stage, how we want to um, set our goals for the next year. Um, next slide. But I think it's really important um, when, when your residents see the budget, they should be able to understand very clearly what government functions we're performing for them, um, how the resources have been allocated to do those functions. I think it allows um, for focus, making sure oftentimes as counselors, we get really good ideas that we are very passionate about. Um, but it also, it, it requires that we have focus. Once we've a, a, agreed to and adopted a budget, we um, don't wanna shift priorities, right? We it, It's codifying the policy decisions so that managers, um, they have a reference, they have authority, but they also have certainty when making operational decisions. Um, and that allows for efficiency in how we provide services. So I wanna kind of wrap up this section and talk a little bit about why why we budget. Um, so, so one, it's the law. Uh, the the balance, adoption of a balanced budget is required um, by either the state law or your home rule charter if you're a home rule municipality. Uh, and also without a budget, there's no appropriation and therefore staff can't go out and spend those budgeted dollars on the priorities that you identify. Again, priorities, setting those priorities, communicating status, uh, your financial status is a key portion of uh, a budget and also communicating your plans to the community and then establishing some key financial policies what is a balanced budget to your government and is this a balanced budget uh, what are our reserve levels what are our rates and fees and then some policies like revenue and debt debt that i mentioned earlier uh, and potentially policies around operational type expenses and capital capital type expenses. And Mayor Pro Tem Sites, I don't know if you wanted to talk any more about priorities or um, communicating financial status here. Um, I, I think it's, uh, as a new elected uh, official, um, I think it's really a valuable tool for you to understand how the organization operates, um, what are kind of the cost of just those baseline services that we provide, where is there room, right, to, to vision and plan with some of those higher um, kind of nice to um, programs and, and um, goals for the community. Um, and it also allows you to explain to residents who might be frustrated um, that you're not doing more in a certain area to talk about your fiscal constraints. Um, so it really is an opportunity not just to communicate with the public, but to expand your knowledge of your own organization. Um, so uh, that's all I have to add to that. Thank you for that. We're going to move on to the next section that we identified at the at the front and talk a little bit about how we how we budget. Uh, and kind of broken this out into three roles, discussing the process. Um, discussing the roles that uh, both elected officials and staff have through this process uh, and different kinds of approaches and ways in which uh, your unit of government can can budget. When I talk about the budget process and I think you've heard a little bit as we've gone through this, but there's a number of a number of really clear steps 
through the budget process. I'll talk about the time frame on some of these items next, but a really kind of high level, um, really what does this mean? And I think something that we identify at the city of Westminster and a number of your cities have as well is, um, let's talk first about uh, what is our strategic plan and vision for the city before we get into um, you know, often the nitty gritty details and programmatic decisions that we, that we uh, make through the budget process. So for us, that involves bringing in a strategic plan consultant, um, you know, often doing um, visioning and updating what might be an annual or biannual strategic plan, providing a status for where you are on that strategic plan, and often reviewing things like a community survey to see how your residents and businesses see your progress on something like a vision and a strategic plan. I think that's a really key portion of the process really to get you started um, and, and get to something at the end that meets, meets uh, hopefully a, a strategic plan and a vision that's set out um, really by, by um, council and potentially senior staff at the beginning of the process. Uh, then thereafter, uh, revenue forecasting, um, as a uh, budget walk, this uh, is, is the most important to my heart. Um, those revenues and items like taxes and fees really drive what you can and can't do throughout the rest of the budget. Um, so starting early with your revenue forecast, but also updating it as you go along. Uh, revenue forecasting is really an art that you'll depend um, on your staff for a lot of their expertise for things like seasonality trends, um, and how those revenues come in on you know cyclical basis and as things change, especially uh, in in moments like these when we're thinking about the the greater impacts to our communities and and businesses and especially sales taxes for many of us right now. Uh, you take that revenue forecast and you're updating it through the process, but you're also talking uh, internal and staff level through departments. Uh, what a, what do the departments need? Um, and these are often uh, comp compiled by uh, staff at a staff level. Um, your city manager or others might go through these to present something to uh, your board or city council. That's a balanced budget process. Uh, there's a lot that goes into these. Um, I think, uh, you know, um, council and, and likely Mayor Pro Tem Sites uh, thinks about, you know, the, the number of questions they ask during a budget presentation. Um, but I promise you, staff going through these ask far more of, of each other and the city manager as, as we go through that process. There are public hearings that take place through a budget process um, that allow the public to have input on uh, typically a, a city manager proposed budget. Um, staff takes that input, takes feedback from your board or council, um, and prepares something that at the very end is a balanced budget as we're required to do to bring forward for um, adoption by the city council. Um, each of us has our own processes for how we do that, um, but then we, staff takes that adopted balanced budget and then executes on it. We use that tool throughout the year to um, plan for and, um, and implement programs and processes and capital projects um, to improve our communities and, and keep our programs going. Um, and then really we start that process all over again. Um, in the city, typically we start strategic planning um, often in February, March, or April, um, you know, typically a couple of months right after that, that budget has been adopted. Um, so this is a process that, uh, that never really stops. Um, you know, you you adopt one and you're you're right into the next one. And then I, from a staff level, uh, we're often looking at three different fiscal years, right? You're, you're currently in a fiscal year that you're administering capital projects and, and uh, those sorts of things. You're looking back to see how um, the previous fiscal year, um, you know, what success looked like um, and how you ended the year financially. And then you're planning for the next one. So we're often looking at multiple fiscal years. I would just like to add real quick before we switch. Um, obviously, Chris has shown what a dynamic process this is. Um, but it, I think in most communities and in Westminster, um, we're constantly working to improve the process. 
always wanting to have a more digestible, easily understood and transparent um, process. So that our residents were really pushing um, it as that communication tool um, for our community. And so I, Chris, what year did you come to work for Westminster? Um, I started uh, just over four years ago, actually. And, and I would say, um, you know, to Chris's credit, um, there has been every single year um, incremental um, and meaningful improvement in our process. I, I appreciate that, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, and I would just, you know, if I could elaborate, something that we've we found key is that a the budget document the staff produces is often hundreds of pages long and has um, incredible amounts of um, programmatic detail sometimes. Um, and I think one of our philosophies as a staff is trying to provide it um, provide it in bite-sized pieces over our budget development process so we don't get to the end um produce a uh, proposed city manager proposed budget um, and then turn around two weeks later and ask you to have read that and be able to um, provide us feedback to adopt it shortly thereafter so try to make it a little more manageable um, from a staff perspective try to make it more manageable um, for the council that then needs to take it review it um, act on it uh, and also for the public as well they see the same same sorts of information as we move along through the process I want to talk briefly about the budget time frame I mentioned this is a year-round process uh, for many staff and also for your elected officials um, but there are some very key and important dates that happened throughout the year and especially towards the end of the year. Um, and I do wanna note right at the front, um, there's some key differences between uh, those cities that are um, home rule municipalities that have a charter and those that are statutory uh, municipalities that fit within um, the state statutes. Um, the, the dates that I have on the screen are those that are uh, critical for uh, statutory municipalities. Um, if you are a home rule charter driven uh, municipality, um, please check with your staff and your attorney to see which deadlines um, which deadlines uh, apply to you and your staff will definitely bring this up as you as you go through the budget process. Um, I'll, I'll um, include in here a couple of items where City of Westminster is a home rule charter municipality is, is a little different. But the state budget deadlines um, we receive uh, new assessed valuations that are preliminary uh, from your county assessor um, on August 25th. That sets a property tax valuation. Um, so you begin to get um, a little insight into what your property tax revenues will look like the following year. Again, for your statutory municipality, on October 15th, um, there's required to be a proposed budget that's submitted to your governing body um, on December 10th, uh, we all get an updated and a final assessed valuation from the assessor. Um, and then by December 15th, uh, your city needs to certify a mill levy um, for those property taxes and then send it to the county. Um, each county has their own process for that and your staff, your staff is well versed in, in how that communication happens. Uh, by December 31st, you're required to adopt a budget for the following fiscal year. And then by January 31st, your budget has to be submitted uh, to the Department of Local Affairs, uh, where it goes on file and they're available for um, your residents to see. Uh, I mentioned home rule municipalities are a little bit different. Um, within the city of Westminster, our charter requires that um, our budget be proposed by uh, September 15th, so about a month early. Um, and then we also are required to adopt it in October um, as opposed to in December. Um, that presents us a few challenges because we have a little bit less uh, financial data where revenues are falling throughout the year. And we also don't have that final assessed valuation um, before we're required to adopt a budget and certify a mill levy. Um, but we all make it work within our own, within our own process. So this is the organizational chart for the city of Westminster. And I wanna use this to talk about roles a bit. Um, this is our you know, senior staff at the bottom. 
city manager um, and the other appointed officials in the middle, um, mayor, mayor pro tem, counselors at the top, and then our, our citizens, residents, and businesses and community um, at the very um, at the very top. And and really, as I think about this, I think about you know detail uh, detail level at the bottom as we're going through our departmental budgets and our review at a deputy and city manager level. Um, and then policy level guidance um, from council, the mayor and the mayor pro tem on the budget. Um, and then again, with residents in our community, we're talking about using this as a communication tool, um, but also providing feedback to council um, on, on a proposed budget. Um, within within the the budget cycle the city manager proposes what's uh, a balanced budget to city council that's initially your your base um at which you can begin to um begin to look at a budget think about changes and think about you know policy level guidance um you want to provide staff on that balanced budget mayor pro tem sites i wanted to let you um input anything here if you if you would like um <laughs> you know i i mean this is a this is an organizational chart and i think it appropriately has the citizens at the top um but i do think it's a real um iterative process where you know the the information is going both up and and down um the, the chart um i think it's really important to note and i think chris did this but um you know we really do have um, each department head with their division managers um, making their requests for what they would like to see um, for the department, making hard choices um, with our scarce resources, really trying to um, use the, the guide of the strategic plan and even citizen budget requests. We get requests directly from our residents quite frequently actually um asking for things as you know as from bike lanes to stop signs um to uh we continually get asked for a archive center i mean so um all of those things are being being processed so it's while it looks like a hierarchical organizational chart i do think it's kind of more circular <laughs> <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. I think it's a yeah, it's a feedback loop all around and uh, and and up and down. So I'm going to apologize uh, for everyone on the call. I have a child that has decided to practice an instrument in the background right now. So hopefully you can hear me okay. I I could hear you just fine. Okay. Um, I want to jump in a little bit more into um, into. Uh, how we budget as we move along here. Um, you know, every city, every city manager, every senior staff grouping probably has their own approach to budgeting and their their preferred system. Um, we've included a number of um, a number of uh, budgeting approaches on the screen um, that go from kind of your your typical to uh, you know what are seen as complex or some newer trends um, that are out there. Um, line item budgeting is probably the basic level of budgeting that you see. Um, again, like that report I showed you at the beginning, um, you look at you know individual lines that often roll up into a department budget. Um, if they roll up into a program budget and you look at look at it programmatically, um, that's often referred to as a program budget. Zero based budget is one that you hear um, a lot about. Um, Often with um, at least uh, senior staff and, and management level, um, you start traditionally with a zero base and then work yourself, uh, work uh, you know, up through decision packages. Uh, sometimes that involves your, your policy level, um, policy level guidance um, from city council. I think that just depends upon how, how in depth um, your city council wants to be involved um, because it often takes a lot of time um, performance budgeting, budgeting for outcomes, and priority-based budgeting um, are some um, more recent trends. Um, although I say recent, and they're probably you know uh, a couple decades, a um, couple decades um, in the making at at, at this time. Um, priority-based budgeting is one that actually started um, in Jefferson County, where you um, 
prioritize and you see quartiles where programs rank in quartiles of their importance and you use that to make um, decisions as to where to apply resources. So when we talk about um, how we budget, I think, and I mentioned up front about revenue, um, you know, where does the money come from is often a, a very critical piece here. Um, so across Colorado, there's some common types of revenue um, that local governments tend to collect. Uh, I mentioned property taxes with the valuation. Uh, most of us are funded primarily through sales and use taxes. You often have other taxes like hotel and motel taxes. Um, charges for services, like maybe recreation fees um, or often utility fees, um, and intergovernmental revenue that comes from the state, the county, the federal government. Um, those are some of the common ones that we think about. Uh, at the same time, there are revenues that we're not allowed to connect to collect, um, and the two that are the clearest examples of that in Colorado that have been um, uh, judged to be out of bounds for us are real estate transfer tax. Um, and, and income taxes um, are, are not allowed. Um, as we talk about revenues, many of these are restricted for specific purposes, and especially in a day and age um, where you have the Taxpayer Bill of Rights um, and taxes that are increased that have a specific purpose tied to them. And um, you know, not just taxes, but often fees. Um, are tied to a specific purpose. And we think of these at a staff level as restricted revenues. Um, and that's often a difficult concept. Um, you might see, you know, several million, hundred million dollars come in and think of that as, you know, all the ways you can use them. While really, um, you know, maybe half of that is, we think of general revenue that can be used for most anything. And then, you know, the other half of that maybe is, is specific and restricted revenue streams that have to be tied to programs or projects. And I would just identify that's where really the art of budgeting comes into play as opposed to the science of balancing budget. And that's something that really your staff can help you with um, is how to take all those restricted revenue streams that might be for this purpose or that um, and use those to take needs um, and plug them in and really at the end of the day, I think about that as maximizing those revenue sources um, to get as much done for your community as possible. Um, another one that's along these same lines and Tabor driven also um, are enterprise funds. Um, we often think about these as golf courses or utilities um, and there's specific rules around enterprise funds um, that uh, your city attorneys will be able to uh, be able to explain to you in much greater detail than I can in this presentation, but um, you can only provide a certain amount of general governmental tax revenue um, into an enterprise fund to keep it whole. Um, but having an enterprise fund um, provides you um, some ability uh, within the rules of Tabor to um, go out for debt for things like uh, utility projects um, and also increased fees and not have them uh, go to a vote of the people. Um, that's again one of those Tabor Tabor restrictions. And I would I would mention I, I said Tabor a couple of times now. Um, Tabor is the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Um, it's something that is very crucial for all of us as we work through revenue streams and expenditure restrictions. Um, and I would just you know highlight um, debrucing is is a term that comes along with with um, Tabor and Tabor restrictions. So debrucing is one of those items that um, gives you more flexibility um, in collecting revenues um, for some of those key and critical purposes. Um, and we hear a lot about that um, across the state, debrucing and, and Tabor restrictions. So those are very critical. CML has some more courses and more information around um, Tabor and also your attorneys and your staff will be able to provide more information there. When we talk about revenues, I wanted to give you a really, you know, a, an example from our city. Um, this is our general fund, so it doesn't include um, revenue that comes into our uh, utility or our you know, parks and open space tax or some of those other ones. So this is really general fund and you'll see where it goes to in a couple of slides here, but um, the majority for us, the overwhelming majority is sales and use tax. Um, then we have fees for service, 
uh, rec charges, intergovernmental transfers, property tax, permits and licenses. Um, so you have a number of a number of uh, revenue streams, but really our, our biggest one is our um, three percent general sales and use tax. So you've got that money. You've identified um, the revenue streams as they come in. Uh, then to balance the budget is looking at both your operating and your capital side for those expenses throughout the year. And this is really where programmatic um, and policy level decisions are made. Um, that, that we talked about a little bit earlier, um, but really you're making decisions as to what programs and um, projects to implement throughout the year. Uh, on an operating side, we see this as salaries and benefits and people, maintenance of key assets, the supplies to provide those services, um, and countless other items, um, contracts to maintain right-of-way and things like that to keep up street lights and whatnot. On a capital budget, we're really talking about larger projects, long-term impact that are not regular expenses. So these are the building of treatment plants, or even at a lower level, a, a sewer line, um, a sewer line, you know, uh, redoing a redoing a building, uh, land acquisition, uh, facilities and buildings right here. Um, and many times it also includes large equipment purchases. Um, you might see your fleet vehicles uh, in a capital budget. Those might also be considered part of operating depending upon um, how your staff works. Um, but many times some of those large graders for streets are considered uh, capital. And then on, uh, on a staff end, there's a number of items that happen behind the scenes as we depreciate the value of those over time. Chris, do you mind me jumping in on that last slide? Absolutely. So I've talked like really broadly about using the budget as a policy um, guide, but I think this is a good example of where you can look at it. So let's say you have a goal of making sure um, that we, we're strong partners for our, our schools or that we have good programming um, throughout our communities. So making sure that we're funding things like libraries or um, rec center programming, you might want to look and, and see if that's in the operating budget. Um, if making sure that we're wanting to maintain infrastructure equitably um, throughout our community is important, you could look at the capital budget and make sure that we're prioritizing projects by need um, throughout the community um, and not just in certain areas, um, making sure there's an equitable distribution. Those are the types of questions that I would encourage you to look at um, when looking at both the operating budget and capital budget. How does this reflect back to our goals and is there a tangible link um, between them? Um, and so I think those are the types of questions. Um, for instance, we had a goal around um, affordable housing and so making sure that there was staff um, within the budget to support that. Um, or if we wanted to do um, business retention, was there were staff and, and programs available within it? And so I, I am not saying, you know, extricate yourself from, from the conversation. I'm saying just make sure you stay at a level that's appropriate. I, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, and, and I absolutely agree. And this, this um, you know, the operating and the capital budgets that really make up a, the total budget for your organization um, are where you see um, really the output from the policy level input that uh, city council provides. Um, so where, you know, you take that affordable housing, um, oftentimes staff, you know, takes that um, direction back from council and figures out how to implement through um, programs or projects that you see in operating or capital. I definitely appreciate that. I talked a minute ago about our general fund revenues by source that included uh, sales and use tax and property tax and uh, rec charges and fees, fees for services. So for, for the city of Westminster's general fund expenditures, um, this is really how that breaks down. Um, some of our heavy hitters in the city of Westminster are uh, police, our fire department, um, parks, parks and recreation and libraries department, um, across a broad range of, of services here. Um, all those services that, that uh, keep the doors open and keep, keep programs running, 
Um, but then also, you know, just remember from this, oftentimes there are other funds within your system. Um, departments may be located in those. Uh, so public works and utilities is a, a small portion of, of this graph, they're 8%, that's actually our streets program. But then the rest of public works and utilities resides in, a, in the city's uh, enterprise fund called the utility fund, where water and wastewater and stormwater are handled. And then there's often intricacies here, um, how the city of Westminster um, does some of their budgets. Uh, we have our benefits and, and a central um, department within our, our system, our financial system called central charges. So you see that in the, in the teal, um, that big portion of the pie, but there's a big uh, chunk of debt service and uh, employee benefits and some other things that reside there that are kind of cross organization. So there's those types of intricacies with, with all of your systems and your staff will definitely, um, definitely explain to you how those things work. I want to walk quickly through um, some items like budget and, and financial policies um, to be on the lookout for um, as you work with your staff through um, an annual or biennial budget. Um, so having a policy in place codifies and puts into writing some expected practice, practices um, that council expects and staff expects out of the budget. Um, and there's a lot of best practices out there from the Government Finance Officers Association um, there's also one that, that GFOA was involved with, um, with a number of um, big uh, national organizations um, that was called the National Advisory Council on State and Local Budget. Um, and they had identified some recommended best practices to follow by establishing broad goals to guide your decision making, like a strategic plan, um, developing the approaches to achieve those goals, developing a budget that's consistent with the approaches that you identified, and then again at the end, evaluating your performance and making adjustments as you move on through that budget. Some common types of these policies include a balanced budget policy. Um, so what exactly does a balanced budget mean for your municipality? How does debt play into that? A fund balance policy, which also includes reserves typically, um, policies around fees and charges and one-time revenues, Typically, one-time revenues um, are allocated to one-time type expenses like capital projects, um, how you handle unpredictable revenues. There's often policies around that. Within the city of Westminster, um, you saw 70% of our general fund revenue comes from sales and use tax, which uh, as, we, as we know nowadays can be um, unpredictable and change um, within a matter of days and weeks. Um, so the city of Westminster has a um, policy-driven reserve called a general fund uh, stabilization reserve um, where we take 10% uh, of our sales and use tax um, and hold it as a as a reserve or 5 to 10% excuse me um, of our sales and use tax revenue and hold it in a reserve um, essentially to account for a rainy day and changes in the economy that um, drive changes in sales and use tax. You have debt policies, um, and then also often you have operations versus capital expenditure policies, um, which are identify the types of expenses that you categorize as capital expenditures. Um, and then I, I wanted to um, put this out here, and then you can have this later on, but uh, Governing Magazine um, produced a really good um, kind of step-by-step -step approach and some policies and practices um, that they've published. Um, to help you as a policymaker uh, make good financial decisions and be able to keep an eye on financial health. Um, so these include a rainy day policy, uh, rainy day fund policy, like I just mentioned, our reserve policy, um, targeting fund balances or how much balances or reserves you want at the end of the year, policy planning, um, and then reporting throughout the process. Um, and then at the very end, I think it's a, a critical one, um, capital investment and how that affects your operating budget. You should definitely look at, um, you know, those big capital projects. If you don't have the money to operate it and maintain it um, after you complete a project, um, you should probably go back and take a look at um, some of the basis for that. And with that, that wraps up um, the presentation portion of our um, our, uh, this, this portion of the class, we'd be happy to take uh, any and all the questions that you have this afternoon.
Great, thank you so much. We do have a, a, a few questions. Our first one is, can a council member see the budget at any time to see where we are, the, the city or town, to see where the city or town is on the budget? So from a um, staff perspective, I, I, would, uh, I, I would say um, many of our charters um, require um, uh, an updated financial report um things like that so i know the city of westminster the charter requires um, a quarterly financial report uh, we actually provide a monthly financial report that goes to city council and it actually gets adopted into the public record and that includes you know a look at major categories of revenues and also expenses by department by um, fund um, and there's there's notes on that throughout the process um, so i do think uh, many of us have a, a measure in place to do that um, but I think that financial reporting and and some form of uh, you know regular interval reporting is key to keeping an eye on the financial status of of a city. And I, that's incredibly relevant right now in the times that we're in. Um, you know, I, you all saw from that pie chart, Westminster gets I think 69% of our general fund um, from sales tax. So um, I am anxiously awaiting. I think I'll be it on um, tonight um, that uh, monthly um, report that Chris just mentioned um, just to, to be able to check in and, and see where we're at and see how this has impacted our revenues so that we as policymakers can start considering you know how how will we potentially have to reprioritize so um, yeah I, I do think it's important to stay up abreast of this information at various intervals Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, so do you show the entire council all of the detail? And in the details, do you break out salaries from benefits for each department? Some of our council and in the community want this level of detail, but we are a small town. Um, with permission, I would like to turn on my camera to show you real quick. I don't know if you'll be able to see it with the slides up. This is, the um this document right here was the 2019 2020 proposed budget and so it is incredibly detail oriented um you know as chris mentioned earlier we do put some of our benefits um and things in central charges um so it's not teased out maybe specifically as you're asking but we do get a pretty um robust amount of information um, but as Chris mentioned, that can actually cause fatigue. Um, and so by breaking it out incrementally for us, I think it allows staff capacity to, to do it. Um, but you're producing that information anyways if you're, if you're creating a, a budget. And so I, I guess I would ask why not share it with, um, with council, um, perhaps um, at, at a pace that they can absorb um, and that your community can absorb, but that data should exist anyway. I mean, you're, you're sharing it with your um, department heads. It's a document that you've, that you've thought through, created, and, and modeled, so. Great, thank and I, you. I, I would just add, I, I have no objection to what uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sites says. You know, we often have, have much of that um, data I definitely work that out through with your staff because everyone's um, <clears throat> everyone's financial um, systems work a little bit differently, um, and uh, and and so there's, there's oftentimes um, you know how how reports are produced might look a little bit different from here to there, um, but I do I do agree, I and mean, we oftentimes have that data, um, and you know work work with your staff. Um, within within your council rules and policies to um, to work on some of those work on some of those items. I just think as a general rule, it's always good to err on the side of transparency and and access to information when dealing with taxpayer dollars. Totally agree. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is asking if you have examples of good dashboards for elected officials for a high level non-detailed look at a financial status in real time? Um, so, so I mentioned earlier, the city of Westminster produces a monthly financial report. 
um, and that is actually in the council agenda packet. It gets approved as part of the record every month. I think that for us is is um, is the clearest um, way to provide that information. Um, there's a lot of staff work that goes into um, doing a monthly and an annual closeout um, to really provide relevant data. Um, and so, you know, staff going through um, and and closing out the month, um, you know, correctly accruing things like payroll and contracts, um, and then providing that to council on a regular interval, I think for us um, works well. I know many local governments use um, tools like OpenGov to provide some of that information. Um, so I think it's, again, it's, you know, setting those expectations um, between staff and council and, and your community um, and then updating them, updating them um, in whatever, whatever, uh, you know, time interval you all decide to continue to provide that information. Great. Okay. And it seems like the last question I have comes from Linda. Uh, she's asking, as a practice, do city councils have their own accounting services? And you can you discuss pros and cons? So I think um, I think the genesis of that is probably, um, although I'm not 100% sure. So um, if you want to if you want to provide a, a comment back, I'd be happy to to address. But I, I think it's. Um, you're thinking about something like a like an annual audit. Um, so I think you know ultimately the the senior staff um, works for you and with you. But then um, separate from that, um, all of our government entities are required to have an annual and an independent audit. And all of us have practices for how that's done. But oftentimes the council is involved in a selection of an auditor. Um, oftentimes the auditors uh, meet with uh, city councils um, separately. Um, some of us have things like audit committees um, to allow that like third party um, oversight. Um, but I think that that uh, audit and the result of that is called the CAFR or the Comprehensive um, Annual or Audited Financial Report um, is, is a really key piece of um, of reporting back to council, the community, um, often investors like folks that buy debt and bonds um, as to the financial state of your uh, community and your financial system and your government. Um, and um, they also note in there if there's material issues with things like practices or how the finances were handled, um, those get reported back. And those are, again, those are a third party independent audit that happens. And I think it's important to note that council is presented that audit report. And so council still has the opportunity to do their oversight role. But I guess if I was going to, my, my main goal of participating in this was really to try to encourage council members to use the budget process as an opportunity to learn more about the organization, to try to make sure that their policy goals that have been agreed upon by the majority of council have been folded into how those scarce revenue dollars have been allocated um, and really try to stay at the policy level and then um, uh, utilize it as a communication tool so your community can see where you're allocating your dollars, um, make sure that their fingerprint is on that and, and that they um, have had the opportunity to weigh in. Um, but I, I don't think that we are or the organization or your community is best served when we act as independent um, fiscal auditors. I, I just, that isn't our role um, and we have staff for that. And then there is that backstop of having that, that CAFR um, presented. And I, I would also add in terms of transparency, um, both the budget and the CAFR are required to be submitted to DOLA, the Department of Local Affairs. Um, every year. Those are published online on DOLA's website um, in their e-filing portal for any of your residents to go and look at. Um, in addition, I really think it's a best practice to publish those on your own website, um, to make those available at City Hall, at your library, 
um, in, a, in a paper form so folks can come and look at those, but also especially having them available on your website um, is, is absolutely uh, key and I think kind of a, a base level of uh, financial transparency. So Linda had a few more uh, comments um, to clear a uh, couple more clarifications. Linda, I'm going to unmute you so that you can uh, uh, share those those clarifications out loud. Sure. So this is um, very inside baseball, very staff oriented, and I'm a staff person. And what I'm wondering is, is um, you know, I, I'm really talking about separate accounting services from the executive. You know, are they are they doing transactions inside city council? Is there a bookkeeper in city council in order to track separately the appropriation that comes to the legislative branch versus the money that um, the executive deals with? Because as we know, city budgets are very complex and so their accounting systems are more complex. However, we have a very straightforward appropriation budget and but but if but since our accounting services are done at the executive level, it's, it doesn't seem to be as straightforward. I, I think I understand your question now. So um, I, from, from our accounting structure, so we have a separate department and business unit set up for um, city council's budget. Um, so things like supplies and promotions um, and any sort of, sort of stipends, um, uh, go through that um, city council budget um, and that's also tracked uh, monthly happy to report on that anytime to um, city council i we don't um so that is that's you know we we track and account for that as a separate department essentially in our financial system but i would say ultimately it's tracked within the city's the same city financial system by the finance department um, you know, folks like our assistants pay POs out of um, out of that that council budget when it's authorized. So we continue to provide staff level support, but we account for that um, so we understand what's going on with the city council's city council's budget themselves. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it seems like that was our last question. At this time, I'd like to hand things over to Sarah Werner. Sarah. Hi everyone, thank you so much for attending today's Effective Governor Governance webinar. I really hope that you got a lot out of the information. Uh, virtual uh, clapping for our presenters who are awesome today. We thank you so much for joining us. It really, um, it's really, really meaningful to share your knowledge with other city officials from across the state. I wanted to mention that we have a couple of upcoming webinars, so if you're interested in some more training, we have uh, Making Smart City Simple, Resiliency for New Normal on June 4th. That is free of charge, and you can register for that on our website at www.cml.org. We also have a virtual conference coming up on August 25th through 27th. This conference will have similar information to what you would see in our annual conference, which is typically in June, but of course we weren't able to have that this year. So uh, more information on that will be available very soon, and I definitely encourage you to be on the lookout for that. On that note, if you're interested in any training or information, I encourage you to check out our bi-weekly newsletter. That newsletter is available both print and online, if you're able, or if um, you know, you're checking email frequently, I would encourage you to sign up for the email edition. You can have as many of those come to your municipality as you want, and you get the newsletter on Tuesdays versus Fridays for, for the actual physical printed newsletter. So definitely take a look at that um, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, if you have any additional topics that you're interested in seeing for future webinars or future trainings, or if you have any feedback on some of the trainings you've attended, I encourage you to reach out to Courtney. Um, Courtney is the one who sent out the emails for this webinar and she'll be sending out an email um, to follow up and let you know where you can find the online recording of this webinar as well. But she can help you um, with seeing if there are topics that we can put together for future events. So I encourage you to reach out to her. 
with that, that is all I have. Courtney, do we have anything else? Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, I would like to say a special thank you to Alamosa Mayor uh, Ty Coleman and to his city manager, Heather Brooks, along with Littleton Director of Communications and Marketing, Kelly Nardi, along with uh, Shira Pullman, who is her digital media specialist. And finally, thank you to Mayor Pro Tem, Westminster, Westminster Mayor Pro Tem, excuse me, uh, Anita Seitz and uh, Chris Lindsay, who is the policy and budget manager. Thank you for all of our attendees for listening today. Once again, you will be able to find this recording and the materials on our website by the end of this week. Uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon and this concludes our webinar.